and welcome to the June 12th, 2023 Tualatin City Council meeting. I'll go ahead and uh, call this meeting to order. We'll start off with the Pledge of Allegiance uh, tonight with Council Brooks reading the pledge. Chris Bagney. Thank you. That brings us to announcements. And we have two announcements tonight. The first being proclamation declaring the week of June 19th through June 25th, 2023 as National Pollinator Week in the city of Tualatin. I believe Emma is here somewhere to give a presentation. And that. Uh, we got a tour. Make sure you hit the button on the. Oh, he did it for you. I'm on. Counselors? Like the specs. No, you got to turn around so people can see them. Yeah. The only problem is how much can you get tonight? <laughs> Our chair of Keith Park. I'm joined tonight by the current vice chair, former chair, Beth Dittman. And we are here just to update the council on um, the city's involvement in Pollinator Week and um, being a bee city, which I think you all know we are. Um, we are a bee city USA, which very much like being a tree city USA has certain commitments that come with it. Um, the key park committee serves as bee city USA committee, and um, we do all kinds of things to create and enhance pollinator habitat in the city. It looks like our slides aren't going. Is that something we could rectify? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, did we that not happen? Guess not. Okay. <laughs> We're going to wing it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be flexible. Oh, um, and one of the most visible parts of being a B city are the um, U B city USA signs and online presence that you see around our city. Um, we have a lot of pollinator events and activities and have planted in the last year over 29,000 um, native trees and shrubs, which promote pollinators in our city and have engaged um, hundreds of volunteers in those activities. I'm going to turn it over to Beth to talk about the community benefits and some pollinator stuff. Uh, to put it in short, the benefits of pollinators are if you like to eat, then you like pollinators. Our pollinators do not just include beautiful bees and adorable butterflies, but also the lesser exciting but equally as important pollinators such as flies and bats. Um, and the benefits to our community is that when we invite pollinators into our community with local and native plants, we also then invite those pollinators um, and that ensures a healthy ecosystem. So not only if you like food and you dislike bugs, for example, then you do like pollinators. Um, pollinators uh, help us maintain a healthy lifestyle from plant all the way to human and, and back around. Um, they're critical to our native species. And again, as I said, a third of all of our foods and beverages come as a result of pollinators helping with that. There are a lot of ways to get involved, unfortunately. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so pollinator group is, is here you can see our planting events uh, when i said hundreds of volunteers 725 um then you'll see the pollinator uh, benefits and the pollinator facts next slide please. next slide please <laughs> next slide please <laughs> i didn't mean this much comedy relief uh next slide please um, and if you're interested in getting involved, there are a number of ways that you can do that. Um, uh, the Backyard Habitat Certification Program, I would say, as a participant, is an amazing resource to find out what in your yard is native and how you can bring more pollinators to your yard. Friends of Trees is an amazing vital partner um, with the City of Tualatin for our Putting Down Roots volunteer event. Um, the Byram School Pollinator Garden is an amazing place to visit. Um, later in uh, this month, uh, there will be a pollinators bio blitz opportunity where uh, citizens in Tualatin can tell you where uh, they have plants and see pollinators. And as you mentioned, as we mentioned when we started, um, Tualatin is very proud to be a bee city USA. People are buzzing about it. And if you'd like <laughs> to learn more, you can check out their website. Um, and we'd like to open it to any questions that the council might have about pollinator week. No questions. Thank you for mentioning yes, that. <laughs> um, 
at their Oregon Zoo, sure they talk about how bats are important to uh, oh, they're all the pollinators the and they are responsible for tequila. Well. So <laughs> if you like that, take care of our um, animals and pollinators too. All right. With that, uh, Council Brooks will read the proclamation. Thank you both for the presentation and enthusiasm and such so much service to the city. I really appreciate it. Um, proclamation declaring the week June 19th through June 25th, 2023 as National Pollinator Week in the city of Tualatin. Whereas pollinators such as thousands of species of bees are essential partners in producing much of our food supply. And whereas pollinators provide significant environmental benefits that are necessary for maintaining healthy, diverse ecosystems in towns and cities. And whereas pollination plays a vital role for the trees and plants of our community, enhancing our quality of life and creating recreational and economic development opportunities. And whereas the city of Tualatin manages parks, public landscaping and other public lands that include greenways, natural areas, and wildlife habitats. And whereas the city of Tualatin provides recommendations to developers and residents regarding landscaping to promote wise conservation stewardship, including the protection of pollinators and maintenance of their habitats. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the city council of the city of Tualatin, Oregon, that the city of Tualatin designates the week of June 19th through 25th, 2023 as National Pollinator Week in the city of Tualatin. All are urged to recognize this observance and support efforts to protect and plant pollinators. The city of Tualatin supports Bee City USA certified affiliate status in their recognition of the value of pollinators by proclaiming June 19th through 25th, 2023 as National Pollinator Week in Tualatin introduced and adopted this 12th day of June, 2023, city of Tualatin. Yeah. And thank you, Councillor Brooks, for your consistent and enthusiastic advocacy for this. Thank you both. Mayor, can I make a reminder that everybody who has a mic in front of them, eat the mic. Our, <laughs> our, um, our, our friends in the overflow room are having a hard time hearing. Okay. They could hear you. All right. That brings us to announcement item number two, a proclamation declaring June 19th, 2023 as Juneteenth Day in the city of Tualatin. And this is led by Councilor Sacco. Thank you. Proclamation declaring June 19th, 2023 as Juneteenth Day in the city of Tualatin. Whereas the city council's 2023 I'm sorry, 2030 vision is, that, is for Tualatin to be an inclusive community that promotes equity, diversity, and access in creating a meaningful quality of life for everyone. And whereas President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, declaring enslaved people as free, paving the way for the passage of the 13th Amendment which formally abolished slavery in the United States. And whereas Texas was the last of the Confederate states to receive orders requiring the end of slavery with Union troops announcing that all slaves were free in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865. And whereas June 19th has a special meeting to African Americans and has been celebrated by the Black American community for more than 150 years. And whereas Juneteenth, Juneteenth celebrates the end of slavery and recognizes the high price Black Americans have paid for civil rights and equal access. And whereas June thir Juneteenth is an, an occasion to remember and reflect on the significant ways that African Americans have enriched society through their contributions. And whereas Tualatin is a community that involve, includes values and welcomes diversity in our community. And we believe that the rich diversity of communities in Tualatin is one of our greatest strengths. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the City Council of the City of Tualatin, Oregon, that June 19th, 2023 is recognized as Juneteenth in the city of Tualatin. 
The community is encouraged to respect and honor our diverse community, celebrate and build a culture of inclusivity and acceptance. Introduced and adopted this 12th day of June, 2023. Thank you, Thank you Councilor Sacco. That brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for anyone to address the city council regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. I know a lot of you are here for, for an item that is on tonight's agenda, but keep your minute, uh, comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone here who would like to address the council, and it could be either uh, in the room or Zoom, this would be the appropriate time. I have three people signed up, uh, but you don't have to be signed up for public comment. I'll start off uh, with uh, Mr. Steve Irvine. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me. This is my first city council meeting and it's uh, an experience. So thank you all for your commitment to Tualatin and what you're all trying to do here. Um, I'm talking tonight about the camping discussion that we had earlier and um, just have a couple of comments. Um, the first thing I would ask the council is what's the objective? If it's to comply with the house bill, great. Um, What's the minimum required to comply? I heard, it seems like we're mixing metaphors a bit. I heard that we really wanna advocate and help the homeless. And then on the other hand, we wanna comply with the house bill. What are we trying to do here? Would the city have done anything differently if the house bill wasn't passed? So would we even be having this discussion if the house bill wasn't passed? Um, that we've been talking about sites. Didn't really hear, Megan, I'm sure did a lot of good work here, but didn't really hear how the sites were selected. I didn't hear a lot of discussion. I did hear that we're talking about a site near the commons. And we talked about the potential of having a hundred campsites at that site. Um, it's a 12 by 12 site and what was presented, I'm not sure where we landed on the spacing between it, but at a 12 by 12 site with a hundred site or with a with a 12 by 12 campsite with 100 sites that could be three to 400 people that you have on that site and i don't know if the city gave consideration to that a 10 by 10 tent 10 by 10 tent will sleep about six people so give some thought to that um that's a lot of people there lake oswego isn't changing um their city ordinances I'm surprised that there wasn't more benchmarking with Lake Oswego if we're trying to do the minimum required to meet the house bill. So that's my question to the council. Why wasn't Lake Oswego considered? I don't see a lot of tent camping in Lake Oswego. So what are they doing? Homelessness is a complicated problem. And I don't mean to sound heartless. I worked in Portland and I've engaged a lot of homeless people there. I've worked at a church. And that's another thing that wasn't mentioned, the beds at the churches in our community what weren't mentioned as resources for the homeless people that we have today. And those churches provide a valuable service that don't seem to have been considered by the council when we talk about resources available. So I understand that homelessness is super complicated. There are people that life just happens to them and they need help. That's why I would advocate to have the smallest possible footprint with the smallest number of sites so that the city can actually help those people that need help. Just to have a site to have a bunch of people, not in favor of that, because what I've seen is people where life just happens, the drug addicts and alcoholics that need help, mentally ill people that absolutely need help, but then there are just the transients that are passing through that are just looking for the best resources that they can have. And I don't think Tualatin should be a home for those. Thank you so much, really appreciate you guys. All right. Uh, next up is per, uh, Peggy Irvine. Thank you. I'm not sure if I have much more to add because he usually talks everything I meant to say too, but um, my, I had more questions, I think, after the meeting than I did before. So, and it said you would take questions into consideration. So I just had a few. Um, the police chief mentioned that it wasn't a very big problem. So I wanted to know how many actual people are homeless that each night on average that you would have to house. So, um, and yes, like Steve said, it was no mention of, you just said the city of Tualatin doesn't provide anything, but I know there are resources at, at churches and other places. 
but um, also it was said that I think um, that it, these sites were near services. And so they were able to access services, which is great, but they're not city service. They're like the one that's smaller one that's near the commons, they would use the commons bathrooms where a lot of families are and people are, or someone, you mentioned coffee shops, but those are, you know, those are businesses. So I'm just thinking, do you have the capacity to offer, provide services for all those people? And there was no mention of um, in these tents, are you allowing drugs, alcohol, firearms, pets, things like that, because then you can't really monitor defecation with people either, but especially with pets. And there's just gonna be a lot of issues. So I feel like you're asking for a lot of problems in Tualatin and when maybe some don't exist, and maybe there are just, you sounded, um, Ms. Brooks, that you are on top of services, which is great. And, you know, you have the resources or you know where to go. And I know that people, Tualatin provides things like that, or there are resources. So that's good. That's what I would suggest too, as a compassionate thing to try to get those people help, which I'm sure it sounds like you guys are, which is great. Um, so I just feel like there's not that big of a problem. Um, I, you would just need to consider like opening up a big area that would create a problem. So that's, that's my, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim McQueen. necessarily have any questions just some prepared comments if that's okay mm -hmm. um we appreciate the time to speak thank you so much uh as a Tualatin homeowner taxpayer father coach um two children in the ttsd school district i'm here to express my dissent from allowing homeless to camp in any of twelve parks or neighborhood green spaces I understand that there are sites in question but we haven't really got a rubber stamp on whether or not parks are not part of it um, but the severity, heartache of this, you know, tragic homeless epidemic on the West Coast, certainly not lost on me. Oftentimes we ask ourselves uh, and others, where is your heart? To that I say my heart is located very close, but still directly beneath where my mind is located. And <laughs> my mind tells me, simply put, introducing homeless into our parks uh, will result in the entire city becoming less safe. And I, I, this is just to be a fact, not just based on overwhelming data, but my own personal experiences. Our family fled Sacramento County four years ago, uh, based solely on the park that the cities uh, and parks uh, I was raised in just transformed into areas that were just unsafe for my family to enjoy. Um, homeless camps, spending nights in parking lots, uh, moving into neighboring trails and forests. Uh, that's really what was to blame. The bike paths, parks, and hiking trails out there are just a terrifying place. Just, just wild uncertainty, really, and the stats are horrifying. Uh, but since living here, my, my children and family, uh, we generally enjoy uh, the experiencing all of Tualatin's parks, nature trails, but I have no doubt that if the homeless are allowed to camp there in the parks, you will not only see a huge decline in recent or um, city-related activities, community sports, day camps, um, family gatherings, but increase in crime. I, like My kids play year-round sports in this area, uh, love to attend sports-related day camps. However, should our parks be turned into homeless encampments? Uh, we just won't participate in those activities anymore. Um, we just feel that there's uh, coaches, referees, camp counselors, oftentimes high school students, uh, their safety will be in immediate jeopardy. Uh, if camping should be allowed in parks and green spaces, one of the primary concerns is what I think we were talking about tonight, where exactly are these people going during non-camp hours? Uh, the probable answer is being surrounding neighborhoods. Um, so with that, again, the police will enforce that, move locations, you know, off of the prohibited hours that are in effect, but, you know, with all due respect, our, our city police force already have enough extraordinary daily circumstances to manage. Uh, we could see those resources be used, uh, put to better use, uh, rather than layering in what could be a major task at their feet and the likes of which they never really experienced in the city at such a potential scale. Uh, furthermore, as to be quite honest, like we, we, we will personally consider moving from the area if we start to see these awesome city parks just become anything like, let's be honest, what Portland has become, which is not great. Um, so homeless encampments, uh, you know, they obviously aren't providing any you know, value beyond what they can do for families who need it. But I think to the point of the who needs it, that's the issue, right? Uh, it's been documented that there's going to be rising costs to the city, increased crime, litter, open air drug markets, that the potential can increase dramatically. Um, I just asked yourselves, what's the city going to look like in five to 10 years? If this happens, because I can tell you if those camps were allowed five years ago when we, we moved in, we probably wouldn't have moved here. 
Thank you. All right. So I encourage folks to uh, come back in two weeks when we have the hearing on the draft ordinance. Uh, but just quick FYI, folks who were here for work session, that uh, public rights away in parks are specifically excluded in part and camping is not allowed in our parks, nor will be allowed in our public right away. Uh, but if you want to keep up to date uh, on the proposed ordinance, go back to the city's website in about a week or so. Uh, you'll see the new draft ordinance that we'll be reviewing. There'll be public comment on the ordinance and we'll be voting on it in two weeks. Uh, are there any other folks waiting uh, public comment at all, Nicole? Right. With that, uh, brings us to the consent agenda. These are items considered routine. They will be adopted by one motion unless someone in council would like an item removed or heard separately later tonight. And that the consent agenda consists of four items. Consideration of approval of the work session and regular meeting minutes of May 22nd, 2023. Item number two, consideration of resolution number 5699-23, authorizing the city manager to execute a maintenance and operations agreement with Randy McLeod and Janine McLeod for Basalt Creek Parkland. Number three, item uh, consideration of resolution number 5700-23, adopting Twalton's equitable housing funding plan. And finally, item number four, consideration of resolution number 5701-23, authorizing the purchase of right of way and easements for the construction of the Boone's Ferry Corridor uh, Phase Two project, part of the Twalton Moving Forward Program. Would a counselor like to have an item remove consent and heard later separately tonight? I move that we adopt the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as read. As read. Any uh, discussions on the motions? All, them over, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? It's unanimous. That brings us to public hearings. Uh, screen just up, and this is Mr. Hudson. Welcome. Consideration of resolution number 5702 23, declaring the city's election to receive state revenue sharing funds for fiscal year 2023 2024. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Don Hudson. I'm the assistant city manager and finance director here with the city. And in front of you this evening is resolution number 5702-23, declaring the city's election to receive state shared revenue funds during the next fiscal year. There are three things the city must do in order to receive this portion of the liquor taxes that are apportioned to us. We must have levied property taxes in the previous year. You must pass the resolution that's in front of you, uh, proving participation in the program. And you must hold two public hearings. The public hearings are governed under ORS 221.770, and these are for a portion of the liquor taxes. One is before the Budget Committee on the Possible Uses of Funds, which was held on May 30th. The second is tonight before the City Council on the Proposed Use of Funds. We are estimating to receive $456,315 in fiscal year 23-24. These funds are not restricted and they're programmed into the general fund budget for uh, other uses and general uses of the city. Cigarette taxes, marijuana taxes, gas taxes, and a remaining share of the liquor taxes are not part of this public hearing. They're governed under another part of the ORS and are apportioned differently. There's, oh, sorry. Um, after that, uh, if you pass the resolution, then we turn it in the state to be able to receive our share in the next coming year. At that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Any, any questions for Don? Council Brooks. I was just oh. motion. <laughs> Go for it. I move to um, adopt resolution number 5702-23, declaring the city's election to receive state revenue sharing funds during fiscal year 20. 23, 20, 24. Second. I have a motion and second to adopt resolution number 5702-23, declaring the city's election to receive state revenue sharing funds during fiscal year 2023-2024. Any discussion on those motions? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Abstain. It's unanimous. Thank you, Don. All right. That brings us to the big item for tonight, our public hearing. Uh, consideration of the Norwood Road Plan Text Amendment and Plan Map Amendment PTA 23-0001 and PMA 23-0001. I have some mandatory verbiage to read uh, for state law, so I'll go ahead and do that first. The state legislature requires the following information to be read. ORS per ORS 197.7635 and 6 and ORS 197.7963B. One, the applicable app criteria for this decision are as follows per TDC 1.032. A, granting an amendment is in the public interest. B, the public interest is best protected by granting the amendment at this time. C, the proposed amendment is in conformity with the applicable objectives of the Tualatin Community Plan. D, the factors listed in TDC 1.032 sub 4 were consciously considered. Item E, the Tiger Tualatin School District Facility Plan was considered. Item F, the amendments are consistent with statewide planning goals. Item G, the amendments are consistent with the Metropolitan Service District's Urban Growth Management Functional Plan. And finally, item H, granting the amendment is consistent with level of service F for the PM peak hour and E for the one half hour before and after the PM peak hour for the Town Center 2040 design type, TDC map 9-4, and E slash E for the rest of the 2040 design types in the city's planning area. Item number two, Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the above criteria or those criteria in the development code which you believe apply to this decision. Item number three, if additional documents or evidence is prohibited, is, sorry, is provided in support of the application, any party shall be entitled to a continuance of this hearing. Item number four, unless there is a continuance before the conclusion of initial evidentiary hearing, a participant may request before the hearing is closed that the record remain open for at least seven days after the hearing. Item five, failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the council and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. The failure of an applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow this council to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in uh, circuit court. Item six, the hearing will begin with a presentation from city staff, followed by testimony on behalf of the applicant and supporters of the applicant. Next follows the evidence against the application. Rebuttal will then be permitted. After evidence is received, by, after evidence is received the hearing will be closed and the council will, be, will deliberate towards a decision. Any tentative decision will be reduced to a final written decision and adopted by the council, usually at its next meeting. And finally, item number seven, if any council members wish to announce any potential conflict of interest, bias or ex parte contact, contract or contact, they should do now, do so now. Council Hillier. Uh, yes, I'd like to disclose my um, ex parte. Um, contacts. I live in the IBOX CIO area. I drive past the multitude of signs in our community that are encouraging the no on Norwood. Um, I have received and read all the emails, uh, both pro and against this uh, um, application. Um, I got the postcard on my door. I turned it into the city and it's in the records. Um, I do want to say that the emails are important and I receive them from people I consider friends, uh, people I haven't met in our community yet, people who I share grandchildren with, and I thank everybody for their um, input. Uh, I also live and I work in Tualatin. Okay. Hey, Council Brooks. Um, I too want to um, express ex parte um, communications. I and I drive by the site often, I live in the area. Um, 
I've had numerous emails. I think all most of them have been to all of city council, but there may be something that was personally addressed to me. I've had um, voicemail messages on my phone um, and several um, communications that way. Okay. Person Pratt. I'll do my ex parte um, disclosure that I, I have read all the emails, which I believe are in the public record. I've seen the signs as I've driven by. I got the postcard on my garage door. And um, I also um, have had a couple people call me about this, which I've just told them that I cannot discuss this issue. Um, Gonzalez. For me, my ex parte is I attended the public meeting on October 25th last year before I was elected to the council. Um, I drive by there every single day. I've received a postcard. I've had emails sent to me directly. I've had on Facebook instant messages directly, and I've had phone calls directly myself. Um, and of course, I drive by that every single day there and back. Okay. Councilor Reyes. Yeah, I want to disclose my expertise. I have um, email communications as well, like uh, most of our my fellow council members. I have forwarded them to the uh city um i've received um just a couple phone calls that i actually have they they really they, i've i've declared that i can discuss the, the matter thank you councillor sacco um i would like to disclose my ex parte communication which includes um I have read the emails uh, written and received um, by the community. I have driven by the Norwood site and have seen the um, the signs posted um, along that area and within my neighborhood. Uh, and basically my ex parte communications are the same as Councilor Sacco, driven by the site, seen the signs, gotten emails, but no phone calls. So, <laughs> phew. All right, I think that covers all of us. All right, so I got some housekeeping tonight, how things are gonna run, I kind of mentioned it a little bit before. Um, so how this happened, what's gonna, how this is gonna roll out is staff will do their report, then the applicant will present, uh, then those folks who are in support of the applicant, then we'll have those folks who oppose the application. Uh, we'll have some folks, possibly maybe, who are neutral, who wanna state their feelings. Uh, and then the applicant has final rebuttal tonight. Uh, at that point, we have the ability to uh, close pu uh, public testimony at that time. How I want to do the folks who want to uh, state their support, opposition, or neutrality is that we'll do the folks that are in Zoom. I understand there's a lot of people in Zoom. Those folks who are in Zoom, uh, please raise your hand. Use the raised hand feature uh, and let folks know if you're in favor, opposed, or neutral so we can sort you out correctly. Uh, we'll do a last call on Zoom once we think we're through everybody on Zoom. We'll then move to folks who are here in person. There are five seats, four seats up here, plus the seats that are here. We'll, I'll call up names and groups of five. Then go ahead and decide, you know, take a seat. Whoever wants to lead the charge first can be sitting in front of us. Uh, at the fourth person, I'll read the next five people, and they'll come up, fill these seats, so we can keep this going tonight. Uh, and I ask that you keep your comments limited to three minutes and that uh, do not state what has already been said before. If you are in support of what has been said to before, just say you support what Joe Blow said. And you, and you don't have to say it all over again. Uh, save that time for yourself to say something new or different. But you can certainly say that I agree with Mr. Joe Blow and Ms. Joe Blow. And here's my additional comments. Uh, I also would like to keep a... Uh, a good decorum. This is quasi judicial, so it is kind of like a court. Uh, so please, no booing, hissing, clappings, uh, you know, snapping of fingers and stuff like that. Uh, let's keep it uh, like you would have behave in a courtroom. Uh, do I have everything? I think that's it. So with that, I'll ask uh, the city to start presenting the staff report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm Steve Cooper, Assistant Community Development Director. I'm joined here tonight by City Attorney Chris Crean. I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, the rather large volume of your packet was put together in assistance uh, with Madeline Nelson, Assistant Planner. Before you tonight, the project description is an application 
to applications by AKS Engineering and Forestry on behalf of Vista Residential Partners and Property Owner Horizon Community Church, a plan tax amendment and plan map amendment applicable to a 9.2 acre site at 23370 Southwest Boone's Ferry Road. As mentioned, there are two applications proposed, the first of which is a plan tax amendment, which would remove the locational factors from the high density high rise zoning district purpose statement found in the Tualatin Development Code at section 44-100, which currently limits the zone roughly to the downtown area of Tualatin. The second part of the plan tax amendment would to revise TDC table 44-3 to limit the structure height to the lesser of four stories or 50 feet in the RHHR zoning district, which would be applicable to the subject site. And then the second part of the request is an application for a plan map amendment, which would change the existing zoning on the 9.2 acre site to high density high rise zoning. This slide shows specifically the proposed text of the text amendment, as you can see in the red strike through, it removes the locational restrictions specific to the RHHR purpose zone. And then under table 44-3 adds a height restriction, a height maximum that would be applicable to the subject site. This slide shows the existing and proposed zoning. Existing zoning is on the left. Again, one acre of RML zoning and 8.2 acres of institutional zoning. If the zone change were approved by council, it would be a combined 9.2 acres of RHHR zoning as shown on the right-hand side of the slide. Along with the application, the applicant has submitted two voluntary conditions of approval. The first of which is the installation of a traffic signal at the Southwest Norwood Road, Road and Southwest Boone's Ferry Road intersection. This would kick in prior to occupancy of future site development. The second voluntary condition of approval is a 60 foot buffer along the Southwest Norwood Road frontage of the site to preserve trees that do not need to be removed for future site access or public roadway improvements such as sidewalks and street widening. Additionally, the applicant has offered three additional conditions of approval. One is a commitment to restrict 10% of the units of the future apartment complex to be affordable to workforce middle income housing for the next 15 years. The second is to construct 40 electric vehicle charging stations. And the third of which is to build the subject development to the US Green Building Council LEED standard. Additional conditions recommended by staff should the council vote to approve the applications. The first of which is to construct a westbound turn lane, left turn lane on Southwest Nord Road headed towards Boone's Ferry. And the second would be the city would con contribute, excuse me, the city would collect a proportional share from the applicant for future construction of an identified transportation system improvement in the Metro Regional Transportation Plan to construct a second right turn lane at the I-5 Boone's Ferry Road southbound interchange. The applicable criteria are found at TDC 33-070. They're also covered quite extensively along with a set of findings analyzing the evidence in the record within your findings and analysis in your uh, packet. The mirrors read through these, and so I'll just kind of go through them pretty quickly, but just again, for your benefit, granting the amendment is in the public interest. Uh, the amendment is timely, and the proposed amendment is conform in conformity with the applicable goals and policies of the Tualatin Comprehensive Plan. The criteria D asks the council to consider consciously the following factors. These include various characteristics of the area of the city, trends in land improvement and development, Sorry, thank you. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, section D requires the council or asks the council, excuse me, to consciously consider the following factors, various characteristics of the city, trends in land improvement and development and natural resources to name a few of these multiple criteria. And then finally, E asks that because the amendment involves residential zoning that the school district substantiate that there's adequate school district capacity um, for 
the additional students that would be generated by the development. F requires the council find that granting the amendment is consistent with applicable state of Oregon planning rules, applicable Oregon administrative rules, including compliance with the transportation planning rule. And then lastly, that granting the amendment is consistent with the Metro Service District's Urban Growth Management Functional Plan. With that, I have Bill Beers, Planning Commission Chair, is in the audience and coming up to provide the Tualatin Planning Commission's recommendation on the applications. Bill? Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Uh, my name is Bill Beers. I'm the Chair of the Tualatin Planning Commission. On April 20th, 2023, we met and voted four to one to recommend denial of both the plan map amendment and the plan text amendment uh, to the city council. So my fellow commissioners and I uh, read every submitted comment. There were less at that time than there are now. Uh, we reviewed and listened to the applicant's presentation and we took a break because that was kind of a long thing. And then we listened to all the testimony just like you did are planning to do Zoom first and then in person. Uh, so after listening to everyone, we discussed the amendment. Uh, we occasionally asked questions to the applicant and to staff. And at the end, we concluded that the proposed text and math amendments are not in the best interest of the public, and they're not in conformity with the goals of the Falls and Comprehensive Plan. Uh, the proposed location is not one to support housing at the greatest density of household living with the greatest access to amenities, and that's consistent with Tualatin's high density residential high rise zone for our comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Any folks have any questions? I'm happy to answer them. Question for Bill. And I'll stick around for a while too if you think of something later. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Beers. And then this final slide just summarizes potential council action. Um, and so we can come back to this slide later in the evening as appropriate. And that, unless the council has questions for staff or our city attorney, that concludes my presentation. Any questions for Steve at this point? All right, with that, welcome Mimi. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Um, my name is Mimi Dukas. I'm with AKS Engineering. And joining me here at the table is Dana Kroschek from Stoll Reeves. We are both here on behalf of Vista Residential Partners. They are the applicant this evening. Um, we are joined by our full project team. That includes Melissa Slotemaker, the lead planner on the project. Um, Austin Cole is on Zoom. Um, we do have uh, Johnson Economics represented by Brendan Buckley. He is on Zoom. Uh, Lancaster Mobley, Todd Mobley is here in the audience. Uh, Todd Prager is the arborist and he is on Zoom. And then Spencer Anderson is on Zoom. I'm gonna start by turning it over to Dana. Good evening, Mayor Bubink and city councilors. Um, I'm gonna start Oh, is it not on? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm gonna start by taking a step back and, and it does feel a, a little redundant because the mayor's script had this information, the staff report had this information, but I think it's worth repeating. The approval criteria are paramount here. Every issue you hear this evening, you need to translate into, how does this correlate to an approval criterion? And not only that, but what does the criterion actually say? Your role here as a judge, you have to consider the facts and the evidence and apply the standards, the standards that this city council has adopted. Um, and then you have to weigh evidence. And when you're weighing evidence, you have to consider things like the source of the evidence and the expertise of the one providing evidence. And so examples, traffic, you're gonna hear a lot about traffic. Standards are very technical, a traffic engineer versus anecdotal. I mean, we all sit in traffic, so we feel like we know a lot about traffic, but you have to consider 
the expertise that's involved, your own city traffic person versus, versus anecdotes when you're considering evidence. What am I supposed to point this out? That's oh, okay. Um, so these are some of the approval criteria that we think are most relevant and that are, are relevant to the issues that are going to be presented to you this evening. I'm not going to read all of them, but things like public interest, you're, you're going to hear about that. Um, policies and goals in the comprehensive plan, that, that's something else you'll hear about. Um, the TPR, the transportation planning rule, and then the statewide planning goal 10 about housing. So public interest, what does public interest mean? There have to be guidelines, there have to be standards that are applicable. And in this case, it's what the city council has adopted in its comprehensive plan and its adopted policies. It's not your opinion, it's not the 100 people that are here's opinion arbitrarily about what they think is in the public interest. As a body, the city has decided and enumerated in the comprehensive plan what is in the public interest. So traffic, again, that space, that issue of traffic, your comp plan tells you what is considered in the public interest, as does the TPR. So if issues related to traffic meet your criteria in the comp plan and in the TPR, then it meets the public interest. Next one. The other criterion about conformity with goals and policies in the comp plan, words matter. Your comprehensive plan deliberately uses different words when it's describing different things. Um, the reason this matters is you're gonna hear about amenities and are there enough amenities nearby? Um, as I'll show, not quite yet, that section of the comprehensive plan talking about amenities is not in a section entitled goals or policies. That means it's not an approval criterion. That means denying this application based on that as the planning commission recommended is not a legal basis. It was wrong of planning commission to deny or recommend denial based on this. So here's a snip of one of your comprehensive plan um, sections, it, it's number three about housing, and you'll see the words that are used, goals and policies. That's what the approval criterion talks about. Next slide. This is chapter 10 about land use designations, where the, the section about amenities is, is referenced. Does anyone see the words goals or policies? No, it's objectives. It's different, it's deliberately, intentionally different, and it's not applicable. TPR, this is the transportation approval criterion. It is very specific and it is very technical. In the staff report, you'll see the criteria alone go on for pages. What is analyzed? The only thing about traffic that is analyzed that is material is what is a reasonable worst case scenario under the current zone? And what is a reasonable worst case scenario under the proposed zone? It's not what's today's situation with a vacant parcel versus what kind of development is going to be built. You have to assume development under existing zoning versus proposed zoning. And then when you look at that comparison, you determine whether there's an impact, a significant impact. If the answer is yes, but that impact can be mitigated, then the TPR is met. It's a technical analysis. And here, the city's in-house traffic engineer and your consulting traffic engineer agreed that TPR has been met. And just to provide you some context, so these are all you know, pretty high level concepts. The amount of traffic we're talking about here, I think it's really important to start the evening off talking about this. In the morning, the proposed zone change reduces the amount of traffic. If you don't um, believe it, you can ask the city engineer or, or your traffic consultants. And the reasons for that is under today's zoning, an elementary school can be built there. And that creates a lot more traffic in the morning than housing does. In fact, it creates 157 more trips. So for example, if this application is not proposed and an elementary school is built there, traffic in the morning will be worse. So what the city's traffic, and these, these 
lines are, are from exhibit F in, in your packet. The city's consulting engineer says that traffic in the morning will decrease and the intersections will perform better. In the evening, there's an increase, 60 trips. And the intersections will perform the same or slightly worse. The next important conclusion is that even if there is no zone change, the intersection of Boone's Ferry and Norwood will fail under existing conditions. But with the zone change, you get a signal there that fixes these impacts. So I think what's important, see, we all think we're traffic experts. The folks that are engineers have concluded this. And I think it's important that the data, the facts, when you're weighing whether you want to provide housing that's attainable for middle, middle income and workforce housing, you're going to be, that's what you're weighing here, housing or perceptions of traffic. We're talking about 60 trips in the evening PM is what the evidence, the only evidence by traffic experts show. Next slide. This is the conclusion of the consultant that the city hired. There's a benefit to the public because of the decrease in existing delays and increases in safety. It'll be safer, there'll be a protected crossing for pedestrians to access nearby transit stops in a future park. That's what the traffic experts are saying. Next slide. The next example of standards, <clears throat> the approval criteria and, and that words matter. This is the, the housing goals, both in state law and in your comprehensive plan. And these are minimums, not maximums. So what your housing needs analysis shows, um, you, you see in the staff report, it's, talks about, it's described as the floor, not the ceiling. Um, why this matters. You're probably gonna hear a lot this evening about how many dwelling units the city has already approved and that we don't need to approve any more housing because we're, we're near what the housing needs analysis has said um, is, is the target for 20 years from now. Um, that doesn't matter. You're allowed to provide more, particularly if you believe, as the evidence shows, that the HNA, while it was based on the best available data at the time, we know that it's too conservative. Um, and, and Mimi is going to go into this. For example, the HNA, based on data in 2016, was adopted in 2019, and it, what what it projected to be the need the, the population 20 years from now, when the census came out you had already surpassed in the year 2019, or was it 2020, what that 20 year projection was. So your housing needs analysis is the best we had at the time, but it's wrong. It's way too conservative. If all you do is meet the amount of housing that that HNA projected, you're already behind the eight ball in terms of providing housing. So said differently, feeling like you cannot exceed the HNA, is not a legally supported basis to deny this application. And that was one of the reasons that the Planning Commission recommended denial. And it's just not accurate. It's not legally supportable to deny based on that. So that's your background on, on what the approval criteria are. Mimi's gonna go into all of the details of the project, but I, I wanted to set the table in terms of really the lens that you should be looking um, at these issues and the evidence through. Thanks, Dana. Um, so I wanna begin by doing a review of the proposal that's in front of you. So we were aware that there would be concerns with this project. Um, we started out from the beginning trying to think through those concerns and, and what we could do to address them. Um, this site plan is not formally in front of you. Uh, the project needs to go through architectural review if, if uh, the application before you this evening is approved, and that's when the site plan will be reviewed. We wanted to daylight it um, to make sure that the public understands what's really going to be proposed, what it's going to look like, um, feel like. Um, so some of the important components that were planned for is retention of the buffer trees that are located along Norwood Road, um, 60 feet. Um, the access point has been shifted to match the existing access to the church uh, so that no additional trees or a minimal number of trees would be impacted with that new access point. 
So retention of the trees, um, we've set a maximum of four story height for this site or 50 feet. That's actually matching the current institutional zone has a maximum height of 50 feet. So we're staying within that. Um, and it matches what was approved at the Plumbeck Gardens project uh, just to the south. And then it's got open space and amenity areas. Through the course of the public review of the application, we did see the need to um, modify the application a bit. Um, we have proposed to, to uh, convert 10% of the units to be um, affordable workforce middle income housing. So that's 80% of median income, very specific, specifically, um, making sure that it is viewed from an equity lens. Um, we're including 40 electric vehicle charging spaces and committing to uh, USGBC lead certification for the project. Dana talked quite a bit about uh, why the application is public in the public interest. Um, fundamentally, there are two components to this. Well, three really. Um, the clear need for additional housing. There is no question that we need additional housing. It is in every news cycle, um, national news, local news. Um, there is a housing crisis within the country, the state, and the region. It's undeniable. Um, that's not enough for us to say, but it's a truthful thing. We've supported that with the reports and data. I'll dive into that in a bit. But you as a council need to balance out the need for that additional need for housing and the potential impacts for it. The primary impact that is up for discussion is transportation. But we have a very clear criteria for how transportation is reviewed within the state of Oregon, and it's the transportation planning rule. As Dana says, it meets transportation planning rule. It meets the criteria. So there's also questions about, okay, if we need housing and it meets the criteria, why here? This was a downtown zone. Why are we moving it out of downtown? So there's, there's a couple components to that. Um, downtown multifamily development is kind of a different animal. Typically it includes structured parking. Um, it's a more urban design. It's expensive, um, it's smaller units, and the rents are higher. That is a type of multifamily housing, and it's an important piece of the equation. It has not worked in downtown Tualatin. You don't have sites that are building out like that. That same type of housing is permitted within your current uh, commercial zones. It takes very, very specific economics to make those projects work. Um, you also have challenges in downtown Tualatin. Uh, you have a lot of environmental constraints. You have a lot of land that's in the floodplain. It's holding development back like this. So why here? Because you need it in both locations. You need it spattered around your community, dispersed through your community, try to get that diverse housing stock throughout the community instead of clustering it into one spot. <clears throat> So the housing need, I said the, the demand is well documented, um, but the specific need within Tualatin um, is, um, it begins with your housing needs analysis. Um, but the Tualatin market, um, multifamily is needed because it is that bridge housing. It, it allows you to um, get into a housing situation before you are ready to um, invest in home ownership. The goal within the um, housing needs analysis is to have 45% of new housing units be multifamily, and that is to achieve that diversity. <clears throat> you, you only have three multifamily projects with over 50 units that have been approved in the last 20 years. So that goes back to my comment about you need to open every opportunity you can to multifamily because it's a very difficult type of land development and it's very, very needed. It is documented within your goals and policies that multifamily is a priority. It's a, um, it, is, it adds housing opportunities for people beyond just home ownership. 
Oops. Whoa. That's a sensitive clicker. Uh, Dana talked about how the housing needs analysis is not a, a um, it's a minimum, not a maximum. There are flaws within your housing needs analysis. Um, first of all, the, the uh, baseline data for your population um, was very low. It didn't follow the, um, it didn't match the census data from 2020. So you can see the table at the bottom of the screen. It began with a baseline of 26,745. That baseline should have been 27,942. That's a substantial difference. So you start with a bad baseline and then your projections are all um, tilted because of that. Furthermore, as Dana talked about, the data for the housing needs analysis dates back to 2016. That was seven years ago. That was before the COVID housing boom. It was before the millennials um, jumped into housing formation. So it's conservative, to, to put it politely. There is much higher demand for housing than what is shown in your housing needs analysis. That is part of why it is a floor and not a ceiling. So from the technical standpoint of your housing needs analysis, it does identify a shortage of RHHR of four acres. So that is your floor. And this is your uh, buildable lands inventory um, from 2019, I believe. And um, that showed 18 acres um, of multifamily land available. And of that, 16 acres has developed out. So this is a key opportunity to add um, housing supply, buildable residential land to your housing supply. There is one existing site that carries the RHHR zone in downtown. It happens to be located in downtown. Um, but as I mentioned before, property in downtown carries a lot of environmental constraints. So this is the site, the existing site overlaid with the environmental constraints of floodplain, wetlands, Title III buffers, natural resource protections. There's just not much buildable land left on that site. <clears throat> so this site is a great opportunity. And why is it suitable? First and foremost, you have a willing property owner seller and you have a willing buyer. It is an opportunity that we all need to jump on while we have it available. Uh, the site is well suited from a topography standpoint. It's got good utilities. It's got access to a major collector and major arterial. Uh, it has bus service along Boone's Ferry Road proximity to the future park. You've got the jobs located in the Basalt Creek corridor. Um, so you increase the opportunity for people to live and work within the same city. <clears throat> and it has access to goods and services and amenities. The site itself will have on-site amenities. The EV charging stations I talked about earlier, open space, pool, dog park, and then a clubhouse uh, with um, fitness center and barbecue. I talked about it before, so why not downtown? Um, you can allow it in both. This does not take away from the need for downtown uh, multifamily. You can still use this zone in downtown when the opportunity arises. When you have a willing seller and a willing buyer, you jump on it. But Right now, before you tonight, you have a site that has willing seller, willing buyer, um, and you have a lot of need and demand. Uh, let's see here. And then the other criteria is transportation. That really goes back to the transportation planning rule. As Dana said, transportation planning rule is looking at the most intense development that is allowed today versus what is being proposed with the new zone, what is the most intense development allowed there and comparing the two. If there's an effect, if there's um, a traffic increase, can it be mitigated? It is mitigated in this situation with the signal and there are frontage improvements in 
um, that will come with the project as well. It gives the pedestrian crossing across Boone's Ferry that is not available today. Um, this will also include the proportional contribution that staff talked about at the uh, Ellingson I-5 interchange as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Dan. So as we've indicated, um, the approval cr criteria have all been met. We've listed them there. What I like about this slide is that it shows you, it, it summarizes some of the critical comprehensive plan policies that are relevant here. And, and you've done the hard work already and you've decided what you should do when presented the opportunity to increase density, to provide more multifamily units and to encourage development of workforce housing. Now that opportunity has been presented to you. This is an opportunity for you to implement all of the policies, all of the goals that you've already adopted in your comprehensive plan. If you fail to implement your comprehensive plan, you're not gonna have housing. Um, how many work sessions and um, presentations have you been through when you're, you learn about providing equity through housing and, and funding for additional housing? Well, this is an opportunity to take action on all of those policies that you've adopted. Next. So at a high level conclusion, you know, some of the public benefits are the, the green building methods, the improvement to the transportation network um, and housing that is affordable to, to workforce housing. Um, we've already heard by the reaction from the folks in the audience, it's, it's housing versus traffic is what this is coming down to. Um, on the housing side, it's a needed housing type um, to that's, attainable by a segment of the population that you've identified as needed housing. On the traffic side, it's reduction of traffic in the morning, slight increase in the evening, but it's all been mitigated. We request that you approve this text and map amendment and advocate for housing through your actions. Thank you. So we do have our full project team here. Um, I suspect you've got some questions and we're happy to answer them. So um, with that, we'll turn it over to you. Questions? All right, Council President Pratt, start. Uh, first, and I, I think this question might be for Steve, but um, when I looked up the term multifamily, that included more than apartments and included the other, um, the housing type diversity, like the um, condos, triplexes. So what is the definition of multifamily? Well, I think that um, the way they have in our code currently is that it would be anything with more than four units, because um, four units under the HB 2001 became basically plexes that are allowed in different locations. And so it would be, but it could be a different, like what you're referring to as far as ownership structures, like the condominium, or other things. So if there's like 10 units connected, Correct. that would be. Yeah, so a smaller, I mean, it could be a small level multifamily complex, like a 10 unit is a good example. Okay, great. Then um, my next question is, um, I'm wondering, um, I mean, I think it's great. You were gonna give 10% of the units to 80% um, of the MFI, but I'm wondering why you limited to 15 years. That concerns me because we have long-term people living there, that's gonna put them in a great burden in 15 years. You have to come up. And start by introducing yourself. I'm Lee Novak with Vista Residential. Uh, yeah, sorry. Typically, um, most deed restrictions tend to spin off after that 15 year period if you look at low income housing tax credits. If you look at low-income housing tax credits, uh, it is a similar period of deed restriction, the 15-year requirement. Um, and also, as projects age, their rents typically decline, uh, and the majority of the project will then be more affordable to folks who are in that 80% uh, range. So that's usually the, the policy rationale for why uh, um, a deed restriction will burn off after a period of time is that overall the project ages and it will uh, um sorry uh, here try this mic 
um, just that overall over time, the projects, this one is better, uh, age and their rents become more affordable. So that's why over after 15 years, it makes sense to burn off the deed restriction. Um, and my next question is about the 60 foot buffer. Um, oh, I'm gonna speak louder too. <laughs> On that 60 foot buffer, um, is any of that included in an area that would be an um, easement or area where, I think that's a county road, Norwood, mm -hmm. where the county could come in and add a lane or um, a multi-use path or something that would encroach on that 60 foot buffer? So the the 60 feet is measured from uh, the proposed right of way. Um, so um, the the county would need to obtain more right of way to to expand it. Um, we do still need to work with the county on what their improvements will be and the logistics of of building that roadway. Um, so, uh, for example, there are public utilities that ex the the public utility easement typically goes um, adjacent to the right of way, and that's where your franchise utilities go. So PGE, um, Comcast, all of that, those need to be undergrounded. And so there could be some impacts to the tree buffer for construction of the, the PUE improvements. Um, we have worked with some of those franchise utilities in the past and been able to do them on the opposite side of the street and just do connections across. Um, and we'll work to do that, but that's a little bit out of our control. Um, does that? It's sort of, I, I'm going to express my concern, and I know you've got your mm -hmm. arborist here, but yep. and even where the trees end, you need some space to mm -hmm. allow for their growth. And um, what I don't want to see is a repeat of what happened at Autumn Sunrise. You cannot leave one line of fir trees. They mm -hmm. don't. That's not how they live or survive. Right. Right. Um, Todd, do you have anything you want to add to the conversation? Todd Prager? Sure, this is Todd Prager. I'm the project arborist with Todd Prager. Todd, you're hard to hear. <clears throat> Are, you able to hear tonight. Me? Are you able to hear me? Okay. Now? You're going to yeah. have to shout. All right. So the goal of our preservation plan is to maintain the the outer edge of trees along that buffer because um, any disturbance to that edge would uh, really compromise the growth of trees um, and we don't want to expose the interior trees to any disturbance so the goal is really to push any improvements as far north as possible towards the uh, roadway such as having a curb tight sidewalk, having utilities under the curb tight, curb tight sidewalk if possible. And um, if there does need to be encroachment with utilities, then boring the utilities underground. So I don't know if you're able to catch all that, but um, that's, that's the plan. So that's the plan, but is there, I guess, <laughs> any assurance we have here? That so that will happen in the end? That assurance happens more with the architectural review. Um, like I said, we, we knew that this was a sensitive topic. Um, it's why Todd is on the project team. Um, and so we've designed the site plan to allow for it, but we have to work with the county on the logistics of their improvements. Um, the, the improvements between the curb line and the right-of-way are really more at the discretion of the city. The county tends to control curb to curb. Um, so we will continue to work with city staff for options like going curb tight with the sidewalk. Um, there's a widened sidewalk in that location uh, because it's a, a pedestrian bicycle pathway through there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we we can follow the, the guidance of uh, Mr. Prager, try to get the utilities either under the sidewalk or on the north side of the road, bore across. Um, there's tools available, but those details get worked out more at the architectural review um, level. We're aware of the sensitivity, staff is aware of the sensitivity, so that would that would get higher scrutiny through the architectural review on the implementation of it. And then um, you've used, I'm going to use your example from the traffic study, but it'd be an elementary school, and mm -hmm. in that aspect, there are you would likely have a large field or something. So I'm wondering if you built the apartments instead, how much of that 
uh, other than this tree buffer, how much of the space would be left as green space? With a in the property theoretical school site? No, as a I'm saying if you had a theoretical school site, there mm -hmm. would like most likely be a field and some green space. Mm -hmm. So with apartments, how much green space is expected? Um, the green space is more of what you saw in the site plan. So we would have the tree buffer and then um, it's a it's a more manicured open space. So there's the the common green with the barbecue space and the um, the clubhouse, the dog walk. Um, so it's improved. Um, it, it's not outdoor play. It's more um, adult recreational space. OK, I'm going to go to the traffic study. And I forgot. What... Oh, on the traffic study, and maybe that's all that's required, but you just you just studied um, peak hours. And I understand that in elementary school, you're going to have traffic at those times. But um, did you look at um, the traffic that like if you have residents, you're going to have traffic during the day, you're going to have mm -hmm. traffic on the weekends. Was that looked at at all? Yes. So we knew traffic was going to be an important issue in the <laughs> in the application. So we are required for this application to review the transportation planning rule. That is a 20 year long range analysis. Because we knew this was an important topic, we actually did the full transportation impact analysis, which looks at the build out situation. So um, it takes our actual proposal and puts it across the roadways as they stand today, not the theoretical 20 year projection of those roadways and their capacity. So you've got both, you've got build out and you've got the TPR analysis. Um, and the TIA does include um, AM peak, PM peak, and um, Todd, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we studied the school peak hour as well. Todd Mobley, you want to come up? What? Good evening. I'm Todd Mobley with. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. I'm Todd Mobley with Lancaster Mobley. We conducted the uh, traffic impact study for this application. Um, yeah, our analysis it's based primarily on the AM peak and the PM peak because we know from years of transportation planning in the area that these are the these are the critical peaks when the congestion is the highest. So that's why. Um, in these types of studies, those are the periods that are focused on. In the long-term transportation planning, it's primarily the PM peak hour. But you also looked at the school peak, right? We looked at, for the operational analysis, we just looked at the morning peak hour and the evening peak hour, but the afternoon peak hour, we could compare trip generation, um, but we, we didn't come do the operational analysis during that peak because it's it, it wouldn't be one of the peak periods where our trip generation is the highest, which is why we didn't. And, um, my last question is about, um, I'm sure you're well aware that's Sherwood School District, and I see that you got something from Sherwood School District saying they could accommodate that. My question is, if you reached out to Talton Tigard School District um, on the expected petitions to go to a school that's less than half a mile away, as opposed to being bused to Sherwood. Uh, we did not. That's that's a couple steps of of um, theoretical, and I'm not sure that the district would know how to react to that. So we didn't. We did not ask that question. We did okay. reach out to the Sherwood School District um, on transportation. I'm sure Dana's coming up here. Um, we do want to remind the council that that we did that additional analysis so that that you would have that information for your knowledge, but it's not actually the criteria. Um, so just bear that with a grain of salt. But it will be the criteria during the, the site plan review. Yes. So it, if this is approved this evening and it goes to architectural plan review, there's another review of traffic and that's the actual build out. What, what are you proposing? All right, those are my questions for now. Thank you. The questions, that's the Hillier. Uh, thank you. Could you clarify, please, in the uh, transportation review, that um, yeah, what did you what exactly did you study? The nine point two acres. I I'm not clear as to 
what I, I, I don't believe that we're looking at apples and apples. And so <laughs> I'm pretty transparent about that. So we did in the thing it's on. We did in the comparative analysis between the existing zone and the proposed zone, the development potential of each considered the, the entire site. So just the 9.2 acres that we're referring to, but it did it encompass any of the autumn sunrise part. Trips from autumn sunrise are included in the in the traffic study by way of of growth rates, we added those trips in, but we didn't, the 9.2 acres is what we did the comparative analysis for what you could build in the existing zone, because that is our site, and what you could build in the proposed zone. So autumn sunrise is accounted for, but it's a separate site, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I quite get it, but I also wonder if, wh why we didn't look at anything except for the peak. Because in my mind, the industrial or excuse me the institutional zone that we're comparing it to mm -hmm. is basically equal in my mind to the autumn sunrise development as a school and those trips are going to go back and forth to sherwood i'm sure many people in this room and zoom have children and you drive back and forth and back and forth at least till they're juniors in high school right and so i'm trying to understand like <laughs> why I, I just don't see that in here and I need your help to find it. And it, well, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. I think you're, we're conflating a couple of different things here. One is the trip characteristics from autumn sunrise. We did include those trips, which occur- At the negative 157? No, that, that's, a, that's a separate comparison. So the negative- Steve, one, I don't get it, so help me. The negative 157 is looking only at our 9.2 acres. If but you, how can we look at only 9.2 acres? Well, let me let me start with our site okay. then. So our 9.2 acres, if you developed a school on that site, okay. um, that's where the a school would generate a lot of trips in the morning, more so than a residential use. So that's why especially from decrease. Sherwood. Correct. And so the site itself has a decrease in development potential during the morning peak hour. A school versus multifamily residential. School generates more trips in the morning. That's just our site. Right. Does that, does that make sense so far? Yeah. I, I, I have a hard time believing that, but yes, it makes sense. Okay. And I'm not an expert, but I do drive the roads. So, and right. I drove my kids to school for a long time. So I would be a person adding to that transportation problem. Right. And that's one that of the reasons me. I I'm with you. I have children that I've driven to school lots of times as well. And that's, that's one of the reasons that schools are really trip intensive in the morning peak hour. That's the busiest peak for a school. And so that's why when we compare development as a school to development as residential, they're different. So we're assuming that these people in the residential 9.2 air acres are not going to leave their home and drive their children to Sherwood. Some may, just like autumn sunrise trips, they're residentials, they're to the extent those people but have kids to go to public school, that's what we would consider those trip destinations, schools, okay. employment, all of that is, is accounted okay. for. And so in that, in your study, as part of your science, do you then assume that a majority of the people will live and work in Tualatin? And that's how you also get to that negative 157? Or is it literally just the school because of how it's zoned right now? So the, the triplet rates within this study are all determined based on the ITE manual. So it, Todd doesn't make them up. He doesn't, you know, dream up, okay, I think it's going to be about this. Those are all within the ITE manual. And it says, if you're doing multifamily in this type of style, this is what your AM trips are going to be. And this is what your PM trips are going to be. Because within any multifamily site, you've got people who are taking their kids to school and you've got people who are going to work and um, the ratios call all kind of average out. So the, the numbers are pretty formulaic, quite frankly, but then you put them over the regional system and you say, okay, here's, here's how they distribute. We, the IT says, this is the total volume. And then Todd looks at the system and says, here's how they disperse out 
based on destinations that everybody expects. And that's reviewed by, by the county engineer. It's reviewed by the city engineer. It was reviewed by ODOT. So that's how the numbers are, are calculated for both oh. AM and PM. And so it keeps it a science. Okay, yes. thank you. So then my next question is, so how then um, we, we keep comparing years of studies. There's 2019, 2021, and I've heard multiple times <laughs> that the study and, and in the reports that the studies are out of date. So what makes you think that this is so accurate just because of this, this the, the numbers that are in there? Like we, I, I just don't feel like apples and apples. Like there's too many reports, there's too many places that say we don't have the most accurate or up-to-date information. So could you help me understand that better, please? So most of what we're talking about for outdated information is about the housing needs analysis. It's the projection for the need for a certain amount of housing. Those are always looking backwards and they say, okay, you've had this much growth historically. We're just going to assume that same growth rate and take it forward. That's not a very sophisticated model. It's, it's the best we've got. But if you have anything weird with the history of that projection or your starting point is incorrect, it doesn't take much for the housing projection to be off. For transportation, Todd went out and he threw hoses and he did actual measurements on the roadway today. And he took the projects that have been approved but haven't been built and he, he projected them and put them on top of that model. So he took real traffic counts. He said, we're gonna have some autumn sunrise traffic. We're gonna have some Plum Black Gardens traffic. I'm going to put those on top of the counts that I already got. And that shows me the background situation. From there, I'm going to take the ITE manual. I'm going to calculate how many trips are coming and going. And I'm going to put them on top of the model. Right? right. Could you okay. remind me what time of year that was done, please? December. The mayor says December. That's December. early or late. I might as well tag into this question because okay. look, based on your analysis, uh, you did it in December 2022 around the holidays. How many days did you do a traffic count? I saw one. Typically, they're done for, thank you. Typically, they're done for one, one day during a peak two-hour window, and then we take the one-hour one hour peak within that two-hour count. So you did it. So you did it in December of 2022 for one day. Or we, we haven't fully recovered from... COVID yet. The, well, that's correct, but that's that's kind of industry practice. That's the ODOT reviewed it. Your own traffic engineer approved it. That's the that's kind of the typical process for these studies is to, mm -hmm. to look at one day, but we would do it when school's in session. Um, we, we have adjustment factors for time of year. ODOT publishes very detailed adjustment factors, so you can, if you count during different months, you can adjust to the, the peak conditions, and all that was, was part of the, the traffic study. Sorry to interrupt you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Councilor Sacco. Thank you. Um, so I'm having a hard time with this elementary school um, theoretical uh, situation. Um, so, so for me with the, with these trips and, and you're right, words, words do matter. And I think some of the words that are being used today, I feel undermined. And I think that, um, and, and, and just underestimated my intelligence when we say that the, that the, the traffic is going to decrease with this theoretical assumption. And I think what, what would better illustrate what would happen for me, what would happen would be what would most likely go on this site versus this theoretical elementary school. And so I'm having a hard time really understanding what the traffic impact would be based on what would most likely be developed in a normal residential scenario. So I feel like we picked this, this worst case scenario, which isn't giving me, I feel like not the right information to make this decision because I feel like it's, we're picking this one, one scenario that mm -hmm. most likely probably wouldn't happen. Um, and so I'd like to know why it was chosen for this scenario, um, understanding that it probably created the most trips and made, told a better story. Um, 
Could you kind of explain that, the, the dis rationale behind that? So we, we, the transportation planning rule says, look at the most intense use under one zone versus the most intense mm -hmm. use under the other zone. So the most intense use under institutional would be an elementary school. That's the highest generating traffic. Well, actually, we had a scenario that was even more intense than that. Um, we, we, in conversations with the city, um, we pulled that back a bit to, to the what's before you tonight. So there is a, a scenario where it could even be argued that it would be more intense and the equivalent of multifamily. Um, but that's why we have multiple parties involved in the scoping is what is reasonable. So, so did we look at what was most likely the most likely build that's, scenario? It's not the language of the transportation planning rule. The transportation okay. planning rule says reasonable worst case and the term worst case doesn't sound great, but that's, that's the statute reasonable worst case scenario under each of the two um, zoning designations. Okay. So if we're going to look at the most intense use of the multifamily site, we have to look at the most intense use of the institutional and compare them. But not likely. Okay. Um, and I, I'm also having this hard time with, um, you know, we have, we have conversations with ODOT and I've been in, in ODOT conversations where they want to get our input because we're the experts that live in our community. So it's really hard then to sit here and sort of discount that the community members aren't the experts that have this lived experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I think that, that it, that's really hard to, again, I, I go back to this traffic's going to decrease. Um, it, I mean, that, I think that's a hard, hard pill to swallow. And again, just doesn't give me a realistic view of what would likely happen versus. So traffic is not going to decrease. Traffic, the most, in, traffic will be less under the most intense. I understand. I, I understand. And okay. the way that it was worded as if, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's in this scenario, it's a confusing topic. I just want to make I'm sure everybody confused. understands. I just, okay. I understand what you're saying. Okay. It was the elementary school versus the, 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 um, and, and I just like to complex. weigh in on, on the likeliness mm -hmm. of it. Um, you know, the rule does say what it says about the reasonable worst case, but when staff was scoping it, they thought it was likely, it was probable that a church would have an elementary school attached to it. Yes, this church currently has an elementary school mm -hmm. elsewhere, but it is that is a compatible use that's likely. Um, one of the more intense traffic generation generating uses allowed in that zone is a community college. And staff said, no, that, that's not gonna happen there, mm -hmm. right next to a church. So there is that degree of, okay, let's not just pick the very highest. It's mm -hmm. given the site size, what's adjacent to it, what is you know, the reasonable worst case scenario. So, so there is that element of what's likely in there. Yeah. That's all for now. Good, good. Uh, Council President Pratt, we'll go back to Council Hillier. Um, my questions are on transportation and um, the traffic signal. If you were putting in elementary school, it seems like you would also be required to put that traffic signal. And so it seems like that's kind of a moot point with this because I'm just making a point. And then I'm also wondering if um, we know toll lanes coming on I-205 and we know that's going to be. So um, was that increased? Can you hear me? Was that increased um, expected traffic included? And is it just the fact that it's going to be a, that we're going to have this terrible traffic? Ugh, oh, gosh. That, I'll just talk loud. That we're going to have this terrible traffic and this is just going to make it slightly worse. Is that what the traffic studies basically saying it, that the effect will be minimal to make it worse than it will already be? So tolling was not studied in, in this um, because it, that hasn't happened yet. So that's not right. But in, until it's adopted and, the, the, and they put off that decision for, for a few years. So what the TPR instructs us to evaluate tolling is, is outside of that. Um, in terms of you know, the existing level of congestion and, and we're making it worse, what TPR says is looking at your property and the impacts of this zone change are you mitigating that impact? It's not asking you to solve all of the problems regionally. It's your impact from changing this zone. And the experts all agree that yes, that, that impact has been mitigated by that signal. 
which is why TPR is, is met. And if I could go back to one question uh, that Council President Pratt had, uh, it was when Mr. Novak was up here talking about the 15 year um, affordability limitation. You know, I think one thing, and, and we detailed this in, in one of our letters, that I think it's important when you're talking about the range of affordability is that the, the housing type is relevant. Um, so for example, in your housing needs analysis, it talks about in the year um, 2018, the houses that sold, and the category of the most um, single family homes that sold are affordable to people in the 150 to 200 MFI range. And then the very next category of homes were affordable only to people in the 200% or higher. And so what that means is a single family home is a lot more expensive than an apartment. And so even without that income restriction for a certain number of units for a certain period of time, having an apartment, a multifamily housing type available provides a, a range of, of housing at a price point that's less than most single family homes in, in your community. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's true. It would be less than um, purchasing a home. But um, that being said, you're building very nice apartments and I don't think they're going to be affordable to people probably under 120 percent of MFI most likely. So some, some will be and that's why we volunteered a condition to make sure that it was. It's a range. It depends on, on the size. It depends on the size. It depends on the finishes. It depends on a variety of things, but we understood there was skepticism. And so that's why we volunteered the condition of approval. Council Brooks. Um, just to dovetail on a couple of things. I know too, and we've, we've seen this, while I appreciate the 10%, to me, it doesn't seem like a big number. And when we have neighboring cities where um, seniors are being evicted right now because of turnover for um, 30 year and 40 year, which would be typical mortgages. And um, that, um, that I, 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 I've never heard of a 15 year before working on the policy advisory board for Washington County and looking at affordable housing. Um, so to me, that number stuck out to me as well. Um, I appreciate the conversation and I'm gonna weigh in on traffic as well um, and that there's standards and that there's a science. Um, and I think that what, what makes us wary is we have these standards and sciences. I used to live somewhere else. Um, that don't seem to work well for our city. We have um, a very tough situation in our city where we have Boone's Ferry Road backed up all across the entire city for two major parts of the day as it stands right now. And we have a failed intersection that ODOT doesn't include in the tolling study that it presents to us. So we have uh, traffic engineers that have talked to us specifically around making things work with traffic engineering, but it doesn't work um, with engineering our lives. And um, so I think there's a certain kind of weariness around um, the reality how well these standards are working in practice in our city. And um, to hear that tolling is not even being included, and this is a looming thing, um, but we know, and our council has been very involved with the tolling conversation, that even though there's a delay, ODOT said they're moving forward and they just like to listen better. So we earlier had a counselor <laughs> say that makes us very concerned. So um, I have more belief in tolling coming, even though it's not something that we're promoting here in our city, it's not gonna impact us well than an imaginary school. Um, and then my other question was, um, um, when we talked about amenities, about swimming pools, we're talking about renters and the way that, that from what I understand, working on this plan, that I actually feel proud of the work that we've done 
and the amount of affordable housing that we've done under this council. We've done different things than previous councils have done. So um, we understand it's a floor. We've done a lot in five years. And um, some of the conversation makes me feel a little frustrated listening to this. I will say that um, when I think of amenities for somebody living in an apartment, it's not a swimming pool. It's about going to the grocery store and access to goods and services, transportation, and with less on our road. So the reason why we would have something like this in our downtown center is so that it would be more walkable. We'd have less trips on the roads because we're already suffering under um, however well these engineers have been planning our engineering, road engineering, traffic engineering for years. Um, and the other thing is when we look at what's happening and coming, like our mayor just was in DC advocating for money for roads. There's no, there's one project that's going to come to our whole state, nobly the interstate bridge. So even improvements on Boone's Ferry that have been on our plan and our tip for a long time, they're going to be on our plan for a long time. That money isn't coming. Um, what's coming is tolling that's going to make Boone's Ferry a way that's an affordable way for the people that live in apartment buildings that are, and, and, and then finally, I'm just going to say like, um, as far as, so, so those, those are the concerns. That's part of the thing with the planning that I, with our city planning, with our planning documents, um, and then with our very deep concerns about um, making agreements with developers that told us right to our faces that they preserve the trees. And we have a, well, maybe it's gonna work out if we work well with the county. So those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about as a counselor when I'm thinking about um, the things that you've talked about, but mostly amenities. Um, I know the traffic thing, there's a lot of, and I think also if you're gonna use um, abbreviated words, I'd rather that you say what they are. Thanks. Other questions? I do wanna, okay, go ahead. Okay. okay. And so I just want to acknowledge that traffic is an issue. I, I, you know, I, we can sit here and say that this development will make it worse. Tualatin Sherwood is backed up. Highway 8, Highway 10, Shoals Ferry 217, everything is F messed up, okay? And so we can sit here and try to be experts. I feel the traffic because I, I drive, I'm on the car every single day working with communities. I avoid this location specifically because it is so bad. But it's no different than 217. Shoals Ferry, Highway 8, and when it comes to housing, you can't forget that there is shared housing between parents and children. So when it comes to affordable housing, this may be it, because we have shared families living together, okay? Um, I don't know how I feel about this yet, but I like housing coming into Walton. There is an unenrollment in the school district because it's unaffordable to live in Walton, okay? That's just the bottom line. We've all come here to have this beautiful community, but yet we don't want to share it. It's too bad. We have these beautiful parks. A park bond just got passed. It's going to increase the entire community. It's going to increase traffic to our community, period. We can sit here and beat this developer down because of traffic, but we did it to ourselves. We voted for the urban growth boundary. We voted for limited car. We voted for all that stuff. Enjoy it, okay? That's just how it is. There's nothing we can do. You can carpool. We made incentives around that. There is all kinds of things around, but traffic, yes, it's going to be a big problem. I understand. It really is. Um, but I want affordable housing, and I understand that people who live, a lot of families live together now. So this may be single family units or single apartments, but we have dual families, and we don't have enough housing. We don't have enough apartments that are affordable. I like this. I don't like the traffic. I really don't, and I can't sit here and say that I support everybody here or, or don't support, but I know that when I was growing up, I lived with 21 kids in our house, okay? Three families, okay? Here we can sit here with an average income of $100,000 in Tualatin and say that 
we all have to live in one house, one family, and it doesn't work that way. Dual families live together. We support our moms and our dads. I'm fortunate that my brothers have so many family members because they help with my mom and dad. And that's common in many low-income housing. Traffic sucks. I get it. But this is another way for people to be able to live in Tualatin, enjoy what we enjoy, okay? I don't know how to get there. You know, the, 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 the growth is coming. Housing is going to get more expensive. We can sit here right now and snapshot and baseline this area and say, traffic is not going to work. But as we move to 15 years, when the average homeowner lives in their house 12 years and they move out, and then we're going to be left with the decisions that we're making today in council, I'll be off the council in 20 years probably, and housing will still be a problem. I, people need to support each other. I know that in my household, 21 kids in one house, three families, that was normal, 1,200 square foot house. We remember in the days before when it was one bathroom. Now, what do we have? Two and a half bathrooms, 4,000 square foot houses? Traffic sucks. I get it. But it's, it's a way for to people to live in Tualatin. Dual families. I haven't made a decision yet, but I know traffic is a big issue here. I avoid that location. But we did it to ourselves. It isn't just this Boone's Ferry. It's every single street that, that feeds everywhere. I live in Fox Hills. We just had um, Commons and Tualatin built. That corner right there is going to be so jammed up with traffic. It was passed. Sure, that property was zoned for that at the time. But here we have a good piece of land that has access to freeways on both directions. You know, Some people may not even go down. They're going to go to Sherwood. We'll probably have people who live in Sherwood. And it's, it's a hard decision, okay? But know this, that people are living together now, especially with baby boomers retiring who can't afford to live on their own. They're being supported by their kids. This may be that avenue. We have no housing. Tualatin, is un kids are unenrolling from this public school because it's unaffordable to live here. Now, they may not come to Tualatin. We have the room in Tualatin High Schools. We do. We don't, I mean, I don't see why, if you were to ask that question, we're low on, on schools right now. So we could use the kids in our public schools to keep our funding up. Okay, there's an unenrollment in the public schools. Funding's being cut because there isn't enough people in the schools. Now, to, this, this development may not do that for us, but it does allow people to live together and have affordable housing. I just don't know where else to send people. People are moving out of Tualatin. Traffic sucks, and I know it. But you can't, no one can sit here and tell me of any good artery that feeds any one of us that's even better. So we did it to ourselves. We wanted no traffic. We didn't invest in roads, and we got to live with it. Now we have to make the best we can. Again, I don't know how I'm going to vote this, but I know traffic is a big issue. I'm not an expert. I'm on the roads every single day. But there's nothing better out there. I, I, I can challenge anybody who can say, what do we have here in our metropolitan area that's better than what we have in Blues Ferry? They're not. They're all the same. They all suck. That's all I got. Uh, Councilor Reyes, we're going to go next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I um, yeah. Sorry, I just okay. want to be clear. This is questions, not deliberations. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. The I, I'm a, I I'm thinking of the obviously traffic. It's a big deal, and I and I spend quite a lot of time reading the the report. Um, I wished that um, it had been done in a way where. Uh, the peak times. I mean, I, I thought I was a little bit um, not sure what was that decision doing it during a, a December when kids are not in when they're not in school or doing coming out of the pandemic time. I feel like that was that for me that I don't know what was the purpose of that. I think if I'm going to do an, uh, some kind of um, exploration like that or some kind of investigation, I will probably go with the highest peak time and. And uh, and then kind of slow down and go back when doing low peak times. I mean, it's just I just thought that was interesting that um, I was looking forward to hearing a little bit more of like the reason why it was done um, during just less than an hour in a in a December month. So um, that was disappointing. Um, the I um, I think that can be I would have. Like I say, if we get more feedback or more information on that, that will be uh, more informed. So we, I will be more informed to make a decision that is 
the best for our city. I do want housing. I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's one thing. That's one thing that, um, that we're talking about. So um, my question is that why, I mean, I guess my, my decision, and I think you mentioned that already, why it was done during a month that there were no kids around or, you know, a time period that it was really not, in my opinion, um, it's not a good information. It's not the best information for me. Sure. And, and Todd, you might want to weigh in, but I thought I heard you say, Todd, that it was taken while school was in session and that there are standards for adjusting during slower months. And so all of those metrics were applied. Do you want to? Yeah. Okay. So the, the counts were done during December, but we, we, they were done when school was in session, as we've talked about a bit. We do have a lot of documented traffic trends. ODOT publishes them in great detail to adjust to peak conditions with the count data we have. Um, we've also done a lot of traffic adjustments through COVID. For a lot of for a lot of time during COVID, we'd go back to pre-COVID traffic counts that were from 2018 or even much older than that, and try to adjust those forward. Um, which, as precise as we wish we were. You know, once we start making those big adjustments, we found that's really not very accurate. And by last December, we did find those counts were actually back to pre-COVID volumes for that month. And so using those published um, adjustment factors, we can actually get much more, much more accurate data. So we've, we've, we've really studied traffic counts a lot during COVID and done a lot of different things to adjust for the for that, the impact of the pandemic. But we have found that recently, even last December, those counts are, are back to pre-COVID conditions. So we can take those counts and we did adjust them to our first month. We, project schedules as they are, we can't just wait for May or a, a month that we would arbitrarily do while school is in session that we think is highest because we have no matter where we do the counts, we need to adjust for some other factors, and that's what was done here. Okay, thank you. And and also the other disappointing thing that I feel like with Councillor Hiller about apples to apples is the um, the comparison of having a a school versus what really were you're proposing here. So um, that was confusing. Not confusing. I like. I, it's more like it's. I don't know if it's the right comparison. And um, it, it didn't make sense to 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 me at least as I was reading, and I'm hearing your your um, your proposal. So I'm not sure what to what we can say about that. I'm just saying that it it's not really what I expected as a comparable. Is it helpful? I'm happy to explain that maybe in a different manner. Um, no, I mean it's just. It won't help. I, I, I just, it just in my mind, I thought I would come, I would hear another comparison of like what the actual site would, would have been with the versus, um, it will be if versus as elementary school and how that would decrease. That was a little confusing in the beginning and then everybody started talking. So I kind of just started analyzing all that and it just didn't make sense in my, in my, in, to me as I'm trying to make this decision. Um, this is this is not about traffic, so um, just I thought I wanted I just wanted to make that comment. Sorry, this this is more about uh, the commitment to restrict ten percent of the units so they can so they are affordable for to workforce middle income household earnings, eighty percent of of area medium income. So for me, um, when you're selecting these, say there's this apartment complex. And you're selecting the families. Is that something that you're all doing? I mean, how do you know these people are low income and it's going to be affordable for them? Because I don't know it, it seems renting is expensive. So uh, renting is relative to home ownership. Uh, renting can be less expensive. Um, the way most projects work on. Uh, 
deed restricted units, um, whether it's in Portland for inclusionary housing, I, was, I assume we'd use a similar system, which is uh, and this, a similar system to what is used in low income housing tax credit units, where we would open up an advertising, people will get on a wait list, people would present housing income data, their, their financial data, which mm -hmm. is what if you were applying for a low income housing tax credit unit, that's what you have to do. You provide your house, your income data. And based on that data, we look at household income. We look at the 80% AMI uh, rules that are published by the state that are used, um, again, for the tax credit housing. Uh, those set different levels of area median income based on household size um, and, uh, and percentage of AMI. And we use those criteria. So it would be very similar to how uh, an approval is done for a low-income housing tax credit project. Does that? And yeah, a little bit. I'm just thinking of someone that makes $15, $17 an hour and, you know, trying to uh, live in a, in Tualatin. I, I just think of how, how difficult that will be. Um, and I guess I'm trying to process that in my, in my head. How, how do we identify someone that's low income um, that will potentially live there in, in the uh, low income um, of, uh, units? So I think it's important to, 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 to look at this project and know it's not gonna be all things for all people. We're not gonna provide the entire range of housing. And as uh, Council Brooks has noted, Fallon has done quite a bit for affordable housing. You just passed Planbeck Gardens. Planbeck Gardens is restricted to folks who are earning less than 60% of area median income. Um, this project is not targeted to that, that um, group of folks in this community. You are doing other projects in order to serve those folks. One of the biggest challenges in multifamily housing is how do you serve people who earn between say 60 or 70% of area median income and 120% of area median income. Because at 120%, they're probably not making enough to buy a home, but they're making too much for, for a deed restrictive or a tax credit affordable housing project. And really that's where this project sits. We're, yes, we are at the higher end of that realm because it's a new project, it's a class A apartment, but by providing more apartments, we also allow there to be more supply. And you know, I first week economics, which I'm sure you all took, supply and demand, the more there is supply, it does allow prices in other places to go down. It provides more options. And that's how we increase affordability throughout the community is by providing options and providing options in multiple locations so that people have housing options and that, that, and that housing at all income ranges is dispersed through your community versus centrally located just in downtown. Thank you. Okay. Right. okay, I have one last traffic question, sorry. Just, could you just share in the science of your work, what is the plus and minus percentage? Over under. The plus or minus percentage? Yeah, it's data, right? Sure. Um, I think it, I think it, it, it improves over time because we we collect a lot of data like Mimi talked about the ITE trip rates we collect what is ITE ITE is Institute no of Transportation Engineers sorry Councillor Brooks um that's a I mean it's a very we, large we, we are just lay people right like we're not the experts so you have to help so to use this as an example that is a very large reference that's used across my profession to do things like estimate how many trips a new development will generate but that data is updated continuously. Old data falls off, new data comes in, those rates change. So, so as time goes on, they, they maintain their accuracy. So it's hard to, it's hard to so answer no your question. I mean, so, okay, so in how, how long have you been a scientist of this? Uh, 26 years. So, so 25 plus years. So, have you ever gone back and looked on the work that you've done 
and real and and been able to do kind of a, a study of oh this is what we projected and this is actually what happened right so could could you share some of that data if you've done it or if not has the industry done that work we have done that and i can tell you that most times when we estimate future conditions this is the build out year this is what traffic's going to look like and what the volumes will be we overestimate what that is so it, so there's going to be 200 less trips potentially no. but i i will say with the methodology that the industry uses and agencies like odot require us to oh. do it's pretty conservative analysis and most times the traffic volumes don't get to the level that we forecast that they will be so most of the time we're analyzing conditions that are worse than what materializes? We're analyzing conditions that are worse than what materializes. I'm not sure I get that. Projecting. Projecting. Yeah, we're like for this analysis, we're projecting conditions in the future by growth rates, adding trips, adding our own trips, all these factors, right? We've, in my experience, doing this for a long time, when we go back later and we do traffic counts. 10 years from now, when the site's developed with something and, you know, we'll find traffic volumes aren't as high as we thought they were going to be. And, and when we do that projection, usually we're over projecting what those volumes are. To be conservative. Right, right. And I could find this on that ITE or whatever it is you said it was. What is it? What is that acronym again, please? So that... Was referring to a specific manual, but yes, it's ITE, Institute of Transportation Engineers, and they published lots of different references. That was one example. And they have a Cliff's Notes, you think? I don't know that they do, but. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. All right. All right. It's not about traffic. My question is back to Steve, and I wondered if you could um, tell me the difference between high density and medium high density. Do you mean just from the like actual zoning designation, which is the density of each housing would go into each? In as far as the built form of it, as it yeah, like density would, would high density be just apartments or would it be? Well, I mean, like suburban high, high well, density versus code. What is high density as opposed to medium high density? That just refers to density. It doesn't refer refer to built form. housing types. Okay, right. Thank you. And so it could be, I mean, it could be the same in, in a, a variety of different zones. Other questions? All right, my turn. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. All right, so there's been a lot of talk about proposed, if comparing this to an elementary school, what did you envision the size of the elementary school being? Because by my math, you are proposing 276 units, correct? And assuming the city's bare minimum amount of car parking, that's 1.65 spots per unit. So you're looking at approximately, you know, 5, 000, 3, uh, 500 cars, 525 cars, possibly being there. So 500 cars coming in and out daily. That's basically what a school is. To me, an elementary school on nine acres would not be that big. So how, what, what was your chip generation? How many cars did you envision coming in and out of this elementary school compared to an apartment that's 276 units, possibly three cars, as uh, Councillor Gonzalez says, most apartment units I know, the one down the street from me, they're three cars per unit because there's multiple people in the unit. So looking at that, by my math, that might be up to 690 vehicles here. So the math for me, please. <laughs> so for your first question, we assumed a, a school of 250 students. Mm -hmm. um, and the, so the transportation characteristics of a school are different than residential uses. Sometimes you have multiple trips with parent pick up and drop mm -hmm. off, um, buses, staff, that kind of thing. So, and schools have those notoriously high peaks, right? So they mm -hmm. generate a lot of trips over a short period of time compared to other land uses like residential. Okay. And so we assume 
a 250 student school. And again, these, these trip rates, they come from that manual that we were talking about, Institute of Transportation Engineers. And so we use those trip rates. So we have a trips per student for a school, we have trips per dwelling unit for multifamily, and that's where those numbers come from. Mm -hmm. And so we know like in multifamily, people work in different types of industries. Some commute during typical commuter hours, some don't. So those, those are spread out throughout the day, but a, a school has those definite peaking characteristics. So the, the types of trips and when they're generated really matter because we're looking at those peak hours. And so the two uses are pretty considerably different. The uses are different, but I think the amount of trips are about the same in my book because you're gonna have the parents going to get their kids in the morning and in the afternoon. So to me, as Councilor Hillier says, to me, apples to apples, the elementary school is pretty close in my mind about the number of cars and vehicles coming in and out of that school is basically the same as your proposed development. There is no difference in my mind. Well, because those, the cars are there, the cars are leaving. The cars are coming and going. Those cars, a lot of those cars would be taking their kids to school in Sherwood and going to work. And then to get back to the ITE manual, has the ITE manual actually reflected today's financial uh, situation where you have multiple roommates in a three bedroom apartment, like I mentioned before, each having a vehicle, or you have to uh, Councillor Oct Octavio, uh, uh, to the Councillor uh, Gonzalez. Uh, mentioned that you have a family with multiple vehicles with the parents working the teenagers. Does the ITE reflect the amount of vehicles in today's market in apartments? It does because of that update in the data that I mentioned before, where some of the older data falls off, newer data comes online. Um, and we've done lots of studies for um, low income housing, market rate housing for multifamily. Um, parking studies for apartments. So we've, we, we've definitely looked at those types of things. So the, to the extent that there are multiple families or multiple vehicle ownership, that those, those factors are reflected in that data. Okay. All right. Uh, Non-transportation question. <laughs> I have to, actually, I, have to, I take that back. So the signal at Norwood is basically a mitigation effort to get people in and out uh, you know, on and off of Nord Road. It's not going to it's not going to alleviate in any way the congestion on Boone's Ferry Road. Correct. Correct. Upstream and downstream, mm -hmm. Boone's Ferry as a corridor. Mm -hmm. It won't it won't fix a corridor level improvement, but it does allow vehicles to get on and off of the arterial. Yeah. Right. And then this is getting really wonky, but as a background, I've been I've read a lot of traffic studies. 12 years, 16 years, what the heck, it's been, it's been a long time. And can you explain the difference between a level D and a level E level of service and an intersection? Because having lived through the midnight hearings for Nyberg Rivers and the traffic impacts are Martin Ozzie and Twalton Sherwood Road and Nyberg, that there will be minimal impact to levels of services, uh, level of service, and seeing what the actuality is of the traffic study that it didn't come anywhere close. It was worse than what the traffic study said. So can you explain what those two levels of service are so folks know? So level of service is very strictly average delay per vehicle in seconds. And I maybe I'm failing my 26 years of experience, but I can't tell you off the top of my head what those thresholds are. But D is adjacent to E, so E has a slightly higher average delay per vehicle. So some cars will get through on a green and they'll have very low delay. Others might have to wait through two cycles and they have very long delay, but on average, that's what's reflected in, a, in level of service. So Good. D is slightly more delay than E. So the frustration folks have on a level E level of service is they're sitting there watching the light turn and they're still sitting there three, four times sometimes on a level E. And what's interesting is a lot of cities find that acceptable, and of course, residents don't. And that's the quandary we're in. Yep. And I once had a traffic engineer tell me that um, with an apartment complex coming into somewhere in Tualatin, I'm not going to mention it, 
that the level of service was E, the impact still kept it at level E, which is a crappier level of E. And so, but it was still level E. So we met the standard, which is again, not what people want to hear. Uh, so I just want to let people know, you know, what that you know, level D and E is because uh, city standard is level D, correct? In certain areas and level E in others. This might be a Mike McCarthy question. That is correct. The, it's level of service D in some areas and others. It's in the approval criteria. Okay. Uh, before I let you sit down, let me go through the rest of my notes. Uh, Can I respond to that one? Oh, yeah, quick? sure. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not here to tell you if congestion is good or bad, right. but the, the performance standard, what's deemed acceptable in terms of meeting a approval criteria is fixed and it does include a fair amount of congestion, which is not a real popularity contest winner with a lot of people. So the standards for better or worse, they allow a, quite a bit of congestion rather and still meet the standard mm -hmm. for acceptable operation. Right. So what's, what's, what's in the transportation system plan, which is part of the comp plan and that's where all of those metrics are established and that's what we compare against. Right. Okay. Yeah. So there was a lot of talk in the study about the Salt Creek Parkway Bridge and, you know, the modeling with it and without it. Um, you know, on this trip that I just took, the Basalt Canyon Bridge is not happening. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen by specifically, I don't know if this is the eight, one of your study or someone else's study. It is not going to be built by 2027. It's not even an MSTIP. MSTIP's right. a disaster. There's no money in the county coffers. There's no money in the federal money. The federal coffers to build this bridge. So there was a 5%. Can you go over what this magic 5% impact is that without the bridge there, what happens? Because the bridge does not happen. Well, I guess to back up a little bit, we we did include scenarios with and without. That was in the near term in the build out scenario, which we sort of voluntarily provided because this is just the zone change for us tonight. That's really not subject to the approval criteria but when the when we looked at the planning horizon analysis we did assume it's in place because it's in the financially constrained project list those are 2040 conditions it's farther in the future so um for the build out scenario though we did look at with and without um that facility in place so with it, it just it changes the distribution of trips if we don't have that connection. To the benefit or hurt of basalt of uh, Boone's Ferry Road. Oh, I will have to. I need to do a little homework to answer okay. that. Can I? Selena, yeah, thank you. you. Oh, you can come back to me. Sure, that's no yes. problem. I'm also looking at, there was another one more question for you. Sorry, sir. <laughs> there was, where is it? Now I had to do with the overpass in Wilsonville and ODOT that the timeline for the, having that done, you know, that's not even anywhere near it. Where is it? Uh, let's see. Oh, the ODOT improvements are not planned until 2028. Or 2040. Yeah. So there's a big time range there. So, so if this application would be, you know, is approved, what guarantee it, do we have those two additional lanes where we get built by ODOT? Because they're saying it might not happen to 2040 per the per their statements. Right. That's the that's kind of the funding priority that's assigned to it in the regional transportation plan, RTP. Sorry, I'm trying to correct my acronym usage. Um, and so ODOT wants to bump that up. Mm -hmm. So that's why for development applications like this, they want to establish that proportional share mechanism. Mm -hmm. Swallowton said they're willing to do that. Um, hopefully Wilsonville would do the same because they're probably a much bigger influence on that. So when we add those kinds of funding mechanisms, then that, that'll move that funding priority forward. It also allows them to if they have some funding already, it, it it puts them in a better position for grant applications to to make that happen soon. 
but it's also a very expensive improvement. So it's outside of the scope of any individual development project mm -hmm. to foot the bill. So this is just a mechanism for each development in the surrounding area that has an impact to pay its own way. Okay, but possibly it's 17 years away. And again, as I mentioned early in work session, this was even on the list for ODOT at JPAC at the feds. It wasn't even an ask for right. ODOT to get this money. It was, it's all about the bridge. It's not about any other intersection. So, okay. Uh, that's all I have for you. Well, I'm going to, I'll find a better answer yeah, for please. you on the 5% and I'm sure I'll be back. All right. Uh, Mr. Prager, please. Are you on the line? Yes. All right. So looking at your study, uh, so there's 199 Douglas fir trees in that buffer area for your study, correct? I don't believe that every tree was a Douglas fir, but roughly the vast majority of them were. All right. So I think you alluded to this before, but explain exterior growth protection to save the interior. So the, the trees along the edges of the grove have more access to light and space and um, wind. And because of that exposure, they develop a better structure, a better crown and healthier growth. Um, so those trees along the edges are really important to preserve um, compared to the trees in the interior of the grove that are more suppressed and don't have as good a structure because they don't have that space and light access. So what happens if some of those trees in the exterior grove uh, mistakenly get cut down? So the, the reason we really wanna protect the exterior trees is because they provide protection for the interior trees. So once those exterior trees are removed, um, it can increase, uh, especially the susceptibility to what's called wind throw, um, which is when trees that aren't used to being exposed to the wind don't have good structure are suddenly exposed. Um, they're less able to withstand the forces of wind and they can um, be more prone to toppling over or being suddenly exposed to more light can um, change that kind of micro environment around the trees and they can become stressed because they're hotter and drier and just not used and adapted to that type of environment. So they could decline as well, even if they don't uh, subject, uh, become subject to wind throw. Okay. So in your survey, you uh, rated the condition of the trees. And for my scanning it and number crunching, the majority of the trees in that area are either in fair, poor, very poor or dead condition. Would you agree with that? And what I'm leading to is getting back to this exterior growth protection that those trees that are on the outside, if they go down, you got a lot of trees in the center that are in poor condition or very poor condition or in fact already dead. Yes, I mean, I don't have the numbers kind of tabulated that way of how many are good, fair and poor, but in general, the good trees are along the edges and the fair and poor and dead are in the interior. So we're just, we're basically relying on these exterior trees to stay happy, healthy, and safe uh, because if they don't, that buffer could possibly end up like the buffer in the adjacent property. I wasn't involved in the adjacent one, but in general, that's why we really stress the importance of maintaining those exterior trees. Um, All right. Because we don't want that domino effect to happen if you remove the exterior. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, next set of questions. I don't know if this is for Mimi or for Steve. So we have our core area urban renewal zone and one of the major projects in that core area renewal zone is what we're calling the catalyst project, which is basically the same type of building in our downtown core. Um, so this is a 30 year urban renewal zone. Our HNA, we have 17 years to reach that point. 
of getting the numbers we want to get. So why is there no mention of the Catalyst project, either by Steve or by Mimi? Because I want to include that because this is another potential housing project, as is the rest of the urban renewal zone. This is envisioned that we will have high density development along with multi-use and that part of the funding for the CORA, that tax increment financing will pay for the fund to do the rezoning required in our downtown to allow this type of housing. So it doesn't seem like that was really mentioned at all in the packet, why? Um, I mean, I, I guess in answer to the question of why, it's because there's not enough particulars about it to sufficiently identify it. I mean, how many units, what's the mix of affordable housing? Is it gonna have structured parking? As the, as the applicant mentioned, it's potentially a different product than this type of application. And I think that the approval criteria don't necessarily call for an analysis of other sites to determine whether or not this site is suitable. I think the applicant has mentioned it here. You've obviously, by mentioning it, have introduced it into the record now, mm -hmm. and so it's here. So I think I'd probably defer to the applicant to have them reiterate some of the statements they made earlier. Okay, because I also, in a conjunction with that, when you're addressing this, the political third rail, if you will, for Tualatin is the Stafford Triangle. The Stafford IJ is going to expire in four years. That Stafford area is going to be wide open for development. And if the additional land on 205 is built by tolling, Below the river is immediate planning can begin. So that area between Borland Road and the river is immediately, built, immediately eligible for concept planning, comprehensive planning and development. And they have lots of willing sellers, believe me. In Stafford, they call me all the time. Again, that's not included in the packet as a potential other source of housing for Tualatin within the next 17 years. And this is way more immediate than the Cora. So. Um, all right. Are you saying that the opportunity for housing would be in the triangle or the triangle development would, would bring more opportunity for downtown? For Borland, Borland Road would be an additional area for Tualatin to have housing. And that's what's in, you know, that is what is envisioned by all the folks in Clackamas County and at Metro is the Stafford Triangle developing in four years, begin the development beginning. Dan is willing to tap me out on this one. <laughs> well, I might just pitch it over to Steve because that's not in your, your housing needs analysis. So it's, is it annexed into your city yet? Not yet. Okay. So that, I think that's why it's too speculative. Um, and I think that's another reason why it may be time to update your housing needs analysis, to have better data, to, you know, contemplate what's going to happen in the Stafford triangle. But we're getting too speculative, you know, that that may be future opportunities, but because it's not within your jurisdictional boundaries, it's not um, before right. you, it's, it's not I a decision. I have 17 years to get here. I have 17 years to get to where I need, where we need to be. Sure, if, that's but, but I think what we're way. encouraging you is to, to aim higher. We, we mm -hmm. think that the number in the HNA is too low because your population has already exceeded on day one of the H and A what where you thought you were going to be in twenty years. So we think that's too low. Um, so you know, if Stafford is annexed, that is a, an opportunity. Um, it'll probably be a lot more single family housing, um, but there might be some multifamily housing opportunity also. Okay. Uh, next one. Let's see. There's mention of the TriMet bus line, the ninety six which currently only runs Monday through Friday during business hours, and a, the possibility of a new line coming from TriMet. One of my concerns there with that assumption is that TriMet doesn't put lines just because there's development there. They put lines because there's ridership data. And right now the struggle we're having is they have no ridership data to build in that line, I think it's the 76. So, you know, you mentioned that that is an amenity for the development, but that bus as of today is only going to be 96 for a while to try and figures it out. Um, so that to me is a challenge for folks who are going to live there. If they don't have a vehicle, they don't have the ability to get downtown for any kind of supermarkets or go to Wilsonville where they want because the TriMet bus service isn't there yet. It might not be there for years. So just a question for you 
I, you do mention it, but there's nothing in there about ridership. Well, the the ridership, TriMet is a, a building, and they a, we will come uh, service, and so yeah, you won't get ridership until you've got some rooftops to mm-hmm. to actually do the ridership. So um, the the um, the part about the equation is that you've already got an established line, so it's easier to increase the frequency of an established line than to try to create a new one. So it's an established corridor. Um, they know that that's a good route to go, that it's got good connectivity, good destinations. Um, and so adding additional uh, residents who can take advantage of that ridership can increase the numbers and then TriMet will react okay. as they sometimes do. Yeah, but they also can take lines away like they did in Beaverton and Cooper Mountain. Yeah. They're taking away lines because there's no ridership. All right. But you also said everybody's going to have three cars. So. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Which, uh, nice segue there, Mimi. Um, I'm here for you, man. So for, I realize there's no parking plan yet. The bane of our existence in council is having residents come asking for, for permitting programs because they have overflow from apartment complexes due to those multiple cars. So how many spots are you envisioning high level of building in this facility. Yeah, I know you're saying 1.65, which is the city standard, but common, we all know that that's too too small. (laughs) I've been living through the 12 and Heights discussion and the apartment complex down the street for me, that those are easily exceeded. And that you have a rural flow going into neighborhoods and then the neighborhoods come to us ticked off. Um, and, and Steve, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the city standard is 1.5 um, for multifamily. Well, the city has adopted standard currently is 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 higher, but we under the CFAC rules under the first part of it, it's one per unit. For yeah, so it's even less. Now. So it's less. We're, so so it's even less. To my I guess to my point, we're planning on 1.65. Uh, typically, in an apartment project like this, one ones that we manage elsewhere in the country. Um, parking is a permitted uh, and we, we are closely managing parking um, because I can't rent apartments if I can't park them. Um, so it is a core process to make sure that we make, maintain a level of parking that is in balance with the resident population. Um, I know that sounds like just me making a promise, but frankly, that is good business uh, and it's functionally necessary for the good operation of the project. Um, to be honest, if people are going to park off site, they're going to go park at the at horizon um, because it's closer than going off in the neighborhoods. In my expectation, that's a guess, but that would, would be what I would guess. Okay. Um, getting to some of the amenities that the applicant has cited, they cited that Horizons Fields would be available to the people in the apartments. Are Horizons Fields open to the public? Yes, they are. All right, thank you. You also mentioned that Sherwood Schools are an amenity, but they're six miles away. For any kind of facility, say if they're going to do baseball or anything like that, it's really not a close by amenity if you can do anything with the Sherwood School District, correct? Did we say that? Yep. <laughs> Believe me, I read this thing. But, but let's not forget the quantity of amenities is not an approval criterion. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we presented that map to show, you know, suitability. Um, so I think that's something important to keep in mind. Okay. And there are plenty of um, amenities, both within walking and driving distance. And the, the description in the comp plan talking about amenities doesn't say within walking distance, which is why, you know, we drew sort of concentric circles to show what was walkable and what was a short drive away. Okay. So going back to the the 10% of units uh, being available for affordable workforce. So basically that's 27 units out of the, out of the complex will be uh, set aside for middle housing uh, based on the latest stats I have. So 80% of AMI is approximately $65,000 of income for a family of four. Um, and that is pretty tough. As was mentioned before, that's going to exclude folks like cashiers, nursing assistants, postal carriers, 
and in fact, some teachers. So why did you pick 80%? Because Tualatin has defined um, middle housing and workforce housing as folks um, with between that 180 and 120%. So we used your definition and chose the lowest range. Once you get below 80% MFI, that's when you get into the affordable housing category, which is typically subsidized. But also in that housing needs, uh, the housing needs analysis, there's a stat that 26% of residents can't afford a two-bedroom apartment at $1,330 a month, which is $41,000 a year in income. So how my, the, what I'm getting wrapped around here is that uh, although commendable, it's not really going to help us meet our goals. This, uh, this complex is not going to, 26 units is going to ha not help us meet our overall goals at all. So and the, the folks that really need the housing, or as you, you mentioned before, 60% or less. So I, I think Lee said it well, this, this project's not solving all of your no, housing exactly. problems. And so, you know, we're targeting the not affordable because mm -hmm. that's government subsidized typically. Um, once you get past the not affordable, you have the middle and then you have high income. Um, you know, we're, we're targeting the middle income, which is the 80 to 120%. You know, when you're talking about what's affordable to someone, it's also the cost burden. You know, you have to consider what's your car payment, mm -hmm. what are all of your other mm -hmm. things. And so when you're talking about whether someone's too cost burdened, it, it considers things other than just their income. Um, the AMI figures also talk about if you're a household of one or if you're a household of six. Right. And so I think it's a little hard to say, well, then if your rent's more than $1,300 a month, how is this going to be affordable? Because there's so many different factors. Um, so that's why you, we use the vocabulary that's within the housing needs analysis of the 80% MFI and, and committing to that voluntarily so that you know that you are addressing you know, that portion of, of the, the population. You know, like we said earlier in our presentation, just having a different housing type is also something that's needed. Your h &A said that 47% of the units provided needed to be apartment units, not single family housing, because apartments tend to be more affordable. So it's a lot of different ways to address what this gap is, um, you know, in, in your housing supply. Okay. Uh, Mimi, so going back to that area in downtown that it's uh, unbuildable, but I've seen plenty of buildings gone up. I've seen the Oregon Nurses Association building go up with parking below it. I've seen machetes be built above the flood line. I've also seen the apartment complexes, uh, the small apartment complex across from Key Bank elevated also. I understand there's an increased cost, but that doesn't make it unbuildable. Right. It's not unbuildable. It's really challenging. And yeah. it's, it, there is a significant financial burden to it. Right. But it could, it can be done. Some of it. Um, floodplain, yes. Um, CWS corridors no mm -hmm. so it depends on the site and the situation um the site that we looked at earlier i believe had both i believe it had a creek through it plus it had floodplain okay and then last question <laughs> so i don't know if this is this is might be a steve question so getting into this middle housing i mean hb 2001 specifically defined middle housing as duplex triplex quadplex cottage cluster, and townhomes. They really never mentioned rental units because the whole purpose of HB 2001 was encourage home ownership. So to me, you mentioned before that multifamily includes quadplex, cottage cluster, and townhomes, correct? The, um, say that again, Mayor. So multifamily housing at a middle housing, you know, with the HB 2001, does include quadplexes, cottage clusters, and townhomes. Correct. And condos, correct? Yes. Right. So, but I can be wrong here. I don't remember HB 2001 ever mentioning apartments as far as middle, as classified as middle housing. So I think we're maybe conflating terms here. I think that the applicant is using the 80 to 120% uh, median family income as a uh, moderate income housing, which is separate and a distinct term from middle housing, which mm -hmm. is a housing typology based on like unit size and unit creation. And so I think that just to draw the line and distinguish between those two terms. Okay. And Thank so you. the applicant is identified in the housing needs analysis 
that there's suggested that the city has a need for also creation of moderate income housing in addition to regulated affordable housing. The, the two types are needed because there's a need in a variety of different income spectrums. But aren't the two terms workforce housing and middle housing interchangeable? For the state? Moderate income housing and workforce housing. But they use middle income. They, they're calling this middle housing workforce housing in the application. I think part of and we, we did call it middle income. You're, you're calling it moderate income. Um, between the 80 and the 120 percent, there's a room for a lot of different housing types. So that bill that you're talking about, I, I don't remember off the top of my head if it includes multifamily or not. That is one way from a state perspective that they're trying to encourage housing types that fit within that. It doesn't mean that those are the exclusive housing types that qualify as workforce or, or middle income or, or moderate income. It's basically the, the what you're talking about is the bill that made single family zoning illegal. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it encourages, allows those types of, of housing because that's where the gap is, that, mm -hmm. that missing middle. Right. Um, and, but that's what the state's encouraging is development of these types of units throughout properties in Tualatin. Right, right. And, you know, I don't know if they include multifamily or, or not, um, but you still have room for the multifamily because we know that's a particular housing type that tends to be uh, more affordable. Okay. I think that's it. You made it through. <laughs> Any other questions right now for the applicant? We got more to go. I have one question. Okay. What? What? Just to clarify, how many parkings? You say one point six five cars per unit. Is that? One. Is it's that now one? It's one per unit per CFAC. Yeah. So the the state has new rules that say the maximum parking you can require is one per unit, and then there's some units. I think if they're what is it less than seven hundred fifty feet, zero can be required. But we're planning on providing in excess in of that two. 1.65 is what's planned. And this is the type of thing um, that would be reviewed during architectural review. Any other questions? Councilor Hillier. So, so just out of curiosity, if the architectural review board comes back to you and says, no, we see these issues in our community and we require three parking spots per thing, what are you gonna do? Um, I'd wanna see what the approval criterion that that was correlated to. Um, you attorneys, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but yeah. seriously, like you'll just I'm, look I'm at the serious. criteria no, and I, the I, architectural I, review board will be, if, right. if they I, don't, if you don't like it, that's what'll happen. I would look at what the basis, what, what the criteria they were basing that request on. Um, and then we would see what we could accommodate on, on the site. Um, and if it brings it down to 200 units, because you'd have to give that up. I mean, how desirable is that any more than? I think it would depend. It, you're, you're asking me a pretty hypothetical question without all the necessary data. Are we going to lose units right. so and that we can provide parking? Probably not. Um, you know. So have you ever thought about building a parking garage? Then what is that going to do to the price point of, of the units? Um, so so no, um, it, it's it's surface parking, and but the parking garage that's the type of housing type that you might see downtown which is why those units are more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's really trying to find that balance. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions at this point? <laughs> All right. Okay, yeah. All right, so I wanna give <laughs> That's people- That's the punchline. <laughs> I wanna give people a break here. Uh, it's what, 9.40? Let's take a uh, 10 minute break and we'll come back at 10 to 10. And we'll start off with the folks in Zoom for those uh, who support, oppose, or are neutral on the application. So we'll see you in 10. Recording stopped. back to order uh, to continue on discussion of item number one of public hearings. I understand the applicant wants to come forward and Good evening. Again, this is Dana Kraftcheck. Um, I've been doing this for over 20 years, and this is the first time 
that this has happened. Um, we appreciate your candor. We understand where this is going. We understand your concern about traffic. Um, we want to respect everyone's time and resources. So we withdraw our application so that we're, we're not asking for this anymore. Okay. So Chris, what's the next steps? <laughs> um, if the applicant has withdrawn the, the application, there's no matter pending before the city council upon which to make a decision. Do I close the hearing? What, what's you, the... you can um, close the hearing. All right. Uh, so since the applicant has withdrawn their application uh, for consideration of PTA 23-0001 and PMA 23-0001, uh, this hearing is now closed and folks can go home. It's not happening. All right. Uh, I'll let everybody leave before we continue. So you can, or you can stay. There's not much left. <laughs> yeah. Mayor, will there, will there be any more public comment at all? No. It's it's for John. Well, I just wanted to thank you. Yeah, thank you. you guys. You guys did your homework. So listen. Thank you. Right. Afterwards, it's going to be quick. <laughs> Afterwards, when we close it, you can. Yeah. We're still in session. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got let we got to wrap this up. All right. We still Yeah, I gotta do the gavel again. All right. You deserve something big. <laughs> yeah, we have to close the meeting. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, we got we gotta close the meeting. So if you quiet down a little bit, then we can shut it uh we can end this meeting. Do the gavel. All right. All right. Uh, that brings us to items removed from consent. Uh, we had none. Uh, council communications. This time I'll start to my right. But she's drinking a soda. Councilor Succo. I don't have any additional communications. Right. Councilor Hillier. Nothing additional, thank you. Council Reyes. Nothing additional either. Thank you. Councilor Gonzalez. Nothing additional, thank you. Council Brooks. I just wanna thank everybody that came up for Pride Parade and um, also want to thank all the people that came tonight um, and the decorum that was met with and my fellow councilors for a pretty long evening and thank, thank you. Council President Pratt. Nothing additional. And I have nothing either. Again, yes, thank you for everyone coming out tonight. Uh, this is a testament uh, to how democracy is supposed to work. Pros, cons, everybody gets heard. Um, uh, sometimes they got a little edgy, but you know we kept it civil. And that's what I appreciate about Tualatin. They never got nasty like other cities. We, we treated each other nicely, even though we might have disagreed, but um, we see how it turned out. So with that, Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> A motion and numerous seconds to adjourn. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. Aye.